The Soviet Union, and later its internationally recognized successor state, the Russian Federation, have long prided themselves on their tank forces. Russia has the world's largest armada of tanks, with a total of 12,566 units in its fleet. This is a number greater than the combined total of North Korea, 6,645, and the United States, 5,500, which come in at second and third place, respectively. So with all this pride about its supposed tank prowess, why has it been so reluctant to deploy its latest and greatest tanks to the battlefields in Ukraine? We all know about Russia's refusal to deploy its few T-14 Armata tanks into battle in Ukraine. It's afraid of losing them. However, Russia has also been hesitant to send its T-90s into combat too, and it's deployed comparatively few of them in Ukraine. Why? Is the T-90 also a tank that doesn't live up to the stories that the Russians have told about it? Or was the T-90 a marketing gimmick all along? Let's take a look at the T-90, Russia's supposedly most advanced main battle tank that it possesses in large numbers and its less than stellar performance in combat. Russia's fleet of over 12,500 tanks is, like many things related to its military, deceptive. Of these, only about 2,600 of them are main battle tanks, and of these 2,600, only about 650 25% of them are T-72 B3B3M, T-80 BVM and T-90 AM models that are outfitted with modern fire control systems. According to the Pentagon, by the beginning of 2023, Russia had lost half of the tanks it deployed since its invasion of Ukraine, thanks to their outdated designs, the armored fleet's poor logistics and doctrine, and poor leadership. The T-72 tank remains the workhorse of the Russian military, and has been the most widely deployed Russian tank to Ukraine, rather than the newer T-90. The T-90 has instead played second fiddle to its predecessor, and with good reason. This supposed modern main battle tank's origins, the design flaw it inherently carries, and how it has performed in Ukraine scream failure. Let us explain. The T-90 saw its origins in the late Soviet Union, when the Western powers were producing tanks like the Abrams, Challenger II, and Leopard II. Soviet tank designers were worried about this development and wanted to produce a replacement for their entire tank fleet, one which could compete with the designs their rivals were now making. However, instead of taking a page out of the West's playbook and designing an entirely new tank, the Soviets based the T-90 on a fusion of the T-72 and the T-80. As it turns out, this may not have been the best choice. The Russian machine builder Ural Vagonzavod produced and built the tank, which entered service in 1992, just after the Soviet Union's collapse. It has since been upgraded with the T-90A in 2004, the T-90M in 2016, and the T-90MS in 2017. Russia probably had between 750 and 1,000 of the T-90 and all its variants on hand prior to the invasion of Ukraine. So how was this tank originally designed? Let's start with the basics. The T-90 is operated by a crew of three. The tank also has an integrated autoloader for its 125mm cannon and a low-profile design. Its secondary weapons are 12.7mm cord heavy machine gun and a 7.62mm PKMT belt-fed machine gun. The tank also boasts a Shatora curtain, an electrical jammer that deploys smoke grenades when a missile targets the tank. Infrared lights are also part of its defensive array and these are designed to confuse the guidance system of an incoming tank-killing missile or rocket. The T-90 is built with reactive armor tiles, which are designed to explode when impacted by a tank-killing munition. This helps protect the tank from the full impact of an incoming round. Additionally, the T-90 is built with composite armor materials to make it more rugged against conventional ammunition and precision-guided anti-tank weapons. Unfortunately, these armor systems have often proven less than adequate and when Russia is involved, you can expect corruption too. Just as we saw in the case of Russian body armor, corrupt officers have had a penchant to sell off the reactive armor panels of the T-90 and other tanks because they are valuable in their own right. To replace them, the officers have installed other materials. At first, rumors went around that they had just put egg cartons onto the tank's sides. This was an easy rumor to believe, given Russia's long history of incompetence that included protecting its soldiers with the airsoft version of the Ratnik body armor. In fact, the material in question is a plastic filler called the 4S24 softcase era block, 
Unfortunately for Russia, this is not adequate protection against modern anti-tank rounds, even if they don't just fly over it like the Javelin does. Russia has tried to develop better defenses for its existing tanks. These attempts include the Arena Armor, which made some waves before the war in video demonstrations. In 2021, Russia released footage of the T-72B3 tank defending itself from an incoming RPG-7 rocket by launching an interceptor that destroyed the rocket in flight. The arena's active protection system was responsible for this and appeared to show promise for Russia as a way to further protect its tanks without overburdening them with heavier and heavier armor. The arena system rings the host tank with several millimeter wave radars pointed at different angles. If these radars detect an incoming threat, they will automatically launch an interceptor out of an armored silo located on the tank. Unfortunately for Russia, the arena system proved to be just another marketing campaign and could not be deployed. The arena system has not appeared in Ukraine at any point in the war. Operationally, the T-90 has a top road speed of 43 miles per hour and has an operational range of 310 miles. The tank weighs about 48 tons. The T-90's weight is about 20 tons less than its Western rivals. One would think this would be to its advantage. However, the additional weight of tanks like the Abrams, Challenger 2 and Leopard 2 is usually put into their armor. This additional armor makes them more survivable, which is critical in a world of precision fire and where the first tank to get shot usually dies. Western tanks are simply better protected and more likely to withstand multiple hits, a fact which we've seen play out in Ukraine's campaign in Zaporizhia, where Russian weapons have often been unable to destroy them outright. Rather, these Western tanks have often been damaged in engagements with their crews surviving. They are then sent to the rear for repairs and put back in the fight. At the same time, Russian tanks, which are often exposed in an attempt to inflict disproportionate casualties on their enemy, get killed in the same engagement without adequately fulfilling the mission they were sacrificed for. Before the war in Ukraine, the T-90 had been a popular tank for international sales. International arms deliveries have been one of the few strong points in Russia's post-Soviet economy. Risking those relationships would be the last thing the Kremlin would want to do, which explains the T-90's comparative absence in Ukraine. The T-90's foreign users include Algeria, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Iraq, Vietnam, Syria, and above all, India, which has long had a close arms relationship with Russia and operates about 2,080 T-90 tanks. Unfortunately, performance in Ukraine is only one of the T-90's problems that questioned its prospects for further export abroad. India's experience with the T-90's has proven far from smooth. Indian T-90 tanks were spotted with the infamous cope cages near its border with Pakistan in the middle of October 2023, demonstrating that India is not entirely confident about the tank's defensive qualities, for good reason, because India has experience with faulty T-90s. For example, to fulfill one Indian order of T-90s, the Russian mounted older, less protective turrets to new hulls. Russia exported these turrets to its Indian customer anyway because it had pre-built a lot of them and didn't want to see them go to waste. These were, however, more vulnerable than newer turrets. The comparative lack of protection was not the only problem either. During tests, the Indians found that their new tanks' fire control systems and thermal imaging sites could not cope with their country's hot summer weather. To adapt the T-90 to this climate, Russian manufacturers offered to build specialized air conditioning systems for the tanks, but these also failed, and a tank driver fainted from heatstroke, which forced India to shop abroad to find ways to solve the problem. These and other issues have made India reconsider its tank relationship with Russia. As tensions between it and China mount, and Pakistan remains a constant threat, the last thing India wants is faulty tanks that would prove ineffective in combat. Indeed, the thermal sights on the T-90 for the tank's commanders have proven so bad that the Russians were secretly installing French sights. However, because of sanctions, these are no longer available. The new T-90s will come with the same Russian sights that proved so unsatisfactory in India. The T-90 compares poorly to Western main battle tanks partly because, as we said, it's basically just a variant of the older T-72. Combined with some parts of the T-80, such as the Irtish fire control system, with reactive armor strapped to the chassis. The T-90 was also not designed with open architecture in mind, which means that it is a difficult tank to keep up to date with modern weapons and equipment. Case in point, the T-90's autoloader can't fire Russia's newer and larger anti-tank kinetic projectiles. 
the Vacuum 1 armor-piercing fin-stabilized discarding Sabot. These rounds were designed for the T-14 Armata, but they cannot be reverse-engineered for the T-90 or older tanks. Unfortunately for the Russians, the T-14 has never materialized on the battlefields of Ukraine, so these new anti-tank rounds, which actually pose a threat to the Abrams, Challenger 2 and Leopard 2, have also been absent from the war. If you want to know why so many Western tanks have been damaged but not destroyed, while their Russian counterparts have gone down in flames, this is one of the reasons. Another of the most glaring problems is the T-90's short effective firing range. The tank's main gun is difficult to raise to high angles. The T-90's gun can move up to a range of 14 degrees upward or 6 degrees downward, which severely limits the targets it can hit. As an example, the T-72 and T-80 tanks deployed in Chechnya proved incapable of raising their guns high enough to shoot at rebels on rooftops or behind third-story windows. These rebels destroyed many Russian tanks with anti-tank weapons, while the T-72s and T-80s proved incapable of retaliation with their main guns. Because the T-90 was based on these two tanks, it suffers from the same problems, and it's proving just as bad in tank-v-tank -tank combat in Ukraine. Western main battle tanks like the American Abrams can hit targets up to three miles away, aided by greater gun mobility. In contrast to Russian tanks, the Abrams can raise its turret to an upward angle of 20 degrees or lower it to an angle of 9 degrees, giving it greater range and flexibility. The T-90 cannot do this, so it will lose out at longer range combat. The T-90 is also comparatively deficient in its ability to puncture the armor of opposing modern Western tanks. To safely do so, it will need to get closer to its targets while enemy tanks can stay back at safer ranges. Obviously, this reality is not advantageous for the Russian tank. Poor doctrine was literally built into the T-90's design. One of the reasons the Soviet planners chose not to go with a completely new design for the T-90 was because they wanted the tank to remain cheap, which its predecessor, the T-72, also was. The T-72 was designed to replicate World War II-era flood tactics and overwhelm its opponents with mass. This design has carried over into the T-90, where it's been implemented in Ukraine to poor results. The tank's cost hints at this purpose, as one T-90 costs roughly between $2.5 million to $4.5 million, depending on the variant, which is much less expensive than its Western counterparts. By comparison, an Abrams tank can cost over $10 million per unit, while the Leopard 2 can cost $6 million and the Challenger 2 around $5 million. This comparison in unit costs reveals the Soviet plans to flood the zone with the sheer mass of T-90s they plan to produce. Unfortunately for the Russians, this mass of T-90s never came. Russia lost much of its tank-producing infrastructure in the chaos of the Soviet Union's collapse. The T-90 was notably absent in the First Chechen War. Instead, the T-72 and T-80 were sent into combat, where they performed poorly. By keeping the T-90 out of the fight in Chechnya, Russia was able to maintain the illusion that it was one of the world's best main battle tanks. The Kremlin went on a marketing spree, pretending there was no need to deploy one of the world's best tanks against poorly organized and equipped rebels in Chechnya. According to the Kremlin, the T-90 was above such trivialities. The marketing campaign worked because international sales of the T-90 picked up. When the T-90 did start to see combat, it performed far below the standards that Russia had made the world come to expect from it. Russia's intervention on behalf of Bashar al-Assad in the Syrian civil war quickly put the T-90 to the test. Just as quickly, footage spread on social media showing Syrian rebels destroying T-90 tanks with old Tau missiles. Bashar al-Assad's army received 30 T-90s from Russia. Five or six of them were confirmed to be destroyed by wire-guided Tau 2A missiles between 2016 and 17. It was a preview of things to come in Ukraine. As early as May 2022, Ukrainian troops proved capable of killing the T-90 with a Karl Gustav recoilless rifle in Kharkiv Oblast. This was the first confirmed kill of a T-90 during the war. According to the Oryx blog, Russia has 2,458 visually confirmed tank losses since the war in Ukraine began. Of these, 90 are T-90 tanks. 34 of the losses are of the T-90A, one is a T-90AK, seven are T-90S tanks, and 48 are T-90M tanks. This data is current as of November 5, 2023. One contributor to these losses is the fact that the T-90 comes with a design that stores its ammunition inside the tank compartment. Once the vehicle takes a direct hit, it and its crew will be blown sky-high. 
Russian tank turrets getting sent skyward in explosions have been a common feature circulating on social media footage taken by Ukrainian soldiers. While most of these tanks have been T-72s, the T-90 is no exception and has met the same fate many times. In October 23, spectacular footage taken by a drone circulated showing a T-90 getting totaled by an anti-tank round in Ukraine. The way Russia has used its tanks has not done it any favors and has instead compounded their design flaws. Russia has repeatedly failed to coordinate its armor with its infantry and artillery, often moving armored columns independently of the other branches of its military. Russian tank crews also tend to be poorly trained. Because Russia has lost tanks at high rates with their crews getting killed in the process, Russian tankers tend to be inexperienced. However, even if Russia managed to find a way to fix these deficiencies, the fact is that its tanks are outdated and incapable of standing up to modern Western armor and anti-tank tactics or equipment. And because Russian tanks like the T-90 are obsolescent designs that are not adapted for open architecture, the Kremlin cannot upgrade its tank fleets like its Western rivals can. In particular, the inability for the T-90s and its older siblings to use the new Vacuum 1 round has put them behind the eight ball when it comes to dealing with the modern tanks that Ukraine is now fielding. The lack of open architecture is especially bad news for a Russia that lacks the means to create an adequate replacement tank for its older vehicle, as seen in the failure of the T-14 Armata program. After a decade, only a handful have been built, and sanctions mean that it will be challenging for Russia to get the parts it needs to build more of them. As the T-90 and its older siblings get depleted, Russia has been forced to rely on even older designs like the T-62 and T-54-55. With the steady losses of T-90s, T-80s and T-72s, Russia's tank force has gotten proportionally more outdated, while Ukraine's has gotten proportionally more modern thanks to the aid of its Western allies. Perhaps this is one of the reasons that the Russians seem to have surged the T-90 into combat in recent weeks. T-90 losses have accelerated as Ukraine gains more ground in Zaporizhia, which may demonstrate that Russia has more T-90 tanks on hand and is no longer willing to hold them back from action. Russian factories seem to be producing more T-90s. However, these are still, by their nature, obsolescent designs, and for Russia there seems to be no way out of this conundrum. Even though Ukraine still mostly uses the older, Soviet-era tanks, its arsenal steadily gets more advanced. Germany has announced it will deliver 14 more Leopard 2 tanks to Ukraine in early 2024 to replace some of the units Ukraine has lost in recent weeks of fighting in its Zaporizhia offensive. Russia, meanwhile, has no choice but to continue depleting its arsenal and hope that it will be able to bleed more than its enemy will. For all the talk about how advanced it is, the T-90 is merely the latest expression of Russia's traditional way of war, using sheer mass to take more punishment than the enemy can until exhaustion sets in. That was, after all, what the T-90 was designed to do, despite Russia's pretensions to the contrary when selling the tank abroad. The T-90 is far from one of the world's premier main battle tanks. It is instead set into a fixed, obsolete pattern, unable to adapt to the modern battlefield and ineffective against even armed rebels with adequate anti-tank equipment, let alone organized Western armies with top-of-the-line equipment. Russia may be able to win through attrition in Ukraine using these tanks as part of the program, but it will come at a high price for little gain and the loss of much of its effective land power. The tank fleet has long been Russia's pride and joy, but in Ukraine, it's getting beaten at its own game and will emerge with far less capability than it had before the invasion began. The T-90 had a lot of hype going into the conflict, but that was all. In the war's aftermath, no matter how it ends up, Russia will have far fewer main battle tanks to call on in any future conflict or to present an effective land deterrent. But what do you think about the T-90 and its results in Ukraine? Is there anything that Russia could have or still can do differently? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit the like button for more military analysis from military experts. How incompetent can Putin get? Since the war in Ukraine started, he's been losing tanks by the dozens on a daily level. His military has been unable to deliver powerful air and artillery strikes or apply modern military tactics and strategies, and the list doesn't stop there. When Russia launched its full-scale invasion of Ukraine, the world's attention was naturally riveted on the land war. There, Russia's poor command structure and logistical incompetence became apparent within the first week, with the attack on Kyiv stalling. Since then, 
Russia has been forced to take hundreds of thousands of casualties in a war of attrition that has raged for 20 months and counting. However, Russia's incompetence has extended to the seas as well. In the build-up to the conflict and early stages of the war, military observers feared that Russia would quickly take control of the seas and stage an amphibious attack on Odessa, Ukraine's third largest city. If Russia took Odessa, it would essentially cut Ukraine off from the Black Sea entirely and leave it a poor, landlocked rump state. Such fears proved unfounded. A landing near Odessa never came. Instead, the biggest stories involving Russia's navy in this war have been of its numerous humiliations. What happened? Today, Russia has essentially ceded control of the Western Black Sea and is increasingly not even safe within its haven in Crimea. But why has the Russian Navy proven so ineffective in the war? To be as fair as we can to Russia, it is and always has been in a bad geostrategic position with regards to the sea. Ever since the days of Peter the Great, Russia has aspired to be a sea power. However, geography makes this difficult to do, as its ports are either contained within choke points, freeze over in the winter, or both. The quest for improved access to the sea has been a vital objective for Russia's foreign policy since the early 18th century, and Russia has never quite been able to achieve this goal. Even at the height of its power during the Soviet Union, unrestricted access to the sea was an objective that still eluded Moscow. In this light, it is understandable why Russia places such a high strategic importance on Crimea and why it was willing to use military force to secure it. It is one of Russia's few warm water ports. Unfortunately for the Russians, there's a problem. The Turks command the transit points between the Black and Mediterranean seas through their control of the Bosporus and Dardanelles. This control was formalized through the 1936 Montreux Convention regarding the regime of the Straits. The convention allows complete freedom of transit for the commercial vessels of any country through these straits during peacetime. In times of war, however, Turkey, if it is not a party to the conflict, can close the straits to transiting ships unless they are returning to their bases. Three days after Russia invaded Ukraine, Turkey invoked the Montreux Convention's wartime provisions for the first time, refusing Russian naval vessels in the Mediterranean access to the Black Sea. For example, at the end of November 2022, two Russian warships left the Mediterranean through the Suez Canal after nine months of idling after Turkey forbid them from transiting through the Dardanelles and Bosporus to the Black Sea. The effect of the Montreux Convention has been to cut off Russia's ability to reinforce its Black Sea fleet. For Ukraine, this was a significant piece of diplomatic aid. It immediately made Russian naval officers more cautious, knowing that every ship in the fleet was precious. Even so, it seemed far-fetched that Ukraine would be able to significantly impede the operations of the Russian Black Sea fleet. That opinion quickly started to change, however. Ukraine proved its ability to strike at the Russian Navy early in the war. Three days after it invaded Ukraine, and on the same day the Turks invoked the Montreux Convention, Russia captured the strategically important port of Berdyansk. The Ukrainian military and Western observers were understandably concerned that the Russian ships that piled into Berdyansk could either land troops in the rear of Ukraine's southern lines or attack Odessa. Then, at about 7.45 a.m. on March 24, exactly a month after the invasion, the landing craft Saratov mysteriously exploded and sank in port at Berdyansk. Ships of the Saratov's class, the Alligator-class tank landing ship, can land up to 425 soldiers or marines with armored support of either 40 infantry fighting vehicles or 20 tanks. The loss of this vessel was thus a significant blow to Russia's ability to conduct amphibious operations. How did this happen? From the beginning of the conflict, NATO has provided Ukraine with excellent intelligence, and Ukraine's intelligence units got the word that the Saratov was loaded with munitions at the time of the attack. Ukraine used this intelligence and a Cold War-era Tochka-U Scarab short-range ballistic missile to carry out the deed. The Tochka-U has a range of about 120 kilometers. We do not know how many of these missiles Ukraine used in the attack, but what is known is that Russia's modern air defense systems should have easily been able to intercept these Soviet weapons. Russian media at the time reported that its forces had done just that, although the real story came in July, when the Saratov was raised from the depths of the sea. Russia's supposedly modern air defense network failed to act against a much older weapon system. Meanwhile, two other ships, the Sezer Kunikov and Novichokask, were seen on video departing from the flaming Saratov. 
They also suffered damage in the attack and were forced to retreat to Crimea. Eleven sailors on board the Saratov died in the incident. Ukraine's next assault on the Russian Navy would become the most famous of the war. This was the sinking of the cruiser Moskva, the flagship of Russia's Black Sea Fleet, in April 2022. This incident was apparently so humiliating for Russia that its Ministry of Defense still offers no details about what happened and avoids talking about it in public, to the point that the families of the sailors on board are still left in the dark about the fates of their loved ones. How exactly this incident unfolded is still unclear. After the successful attack, American sources reported that the Ukrainians had used liquid-fueled Neptune anti-ship cruise missiles, sending them to coordinates provided by U.S. intelligence by way of a P-8 Poseidon maritime surveillance aircraft that flew out of Italy and looked around the Black Sea. Ukraine denied this report, however. According to the Ukrainians, April 13, 2022 was the worst day to sink the cruiser because the weather was so bad for such a precise, premeditated attack. The coastline was covered with low, dark rain clouds on that day. The Ukrainian radars in the area had a limited 18-kilometer range because of the bad weather. Knowing this, the Moskva's crew got a wee bit careless. According to Ukrainian sources, at the time of the invasion, we had no over-the-horizon radars and Russia knew it. But since the clouds were very low and a signal in this corridor between the water and the clouds had nowhere to go, the radar suddenly reached and identified Moskva. The ship's crew seemingly ignored this potentially deadly situation and were so lax about their security that the air defense systems were inactive. They had not noticed that they had just sailed to within the Neptune's 200-kilometer range. Ukraine may have at this point used a Turkish Bayraktar TB2 drone to distract the Moskva and then launch the missiles. For a while after the attack, Ukrainian crews did not know what happened but radar soon revealed that four Russian ships were rushing to the Moskva from different directions. Later, the Ukrainians realized that a tugboat had also been dispatched from Crimea, hoping to save the ailing ship. At this point, the weather cooperated again too, when a storm began at sea and made rescue operations much harder. It became impossible to save the Moskva then, and it sank beneath the waves. Hundreds of Russian sailors reportedly saw their flagship get hit by two Neptune missiles. The Moskva incident is more baffling because the ship was an air defense cruiser. If running properly, the Moskva should have gotten as much as four minutes of warning that the Ukrainian cruise missiles were on their way. The Russian cruiser also had a triple layer of protection against such air attacks. Its defenses included the S-300F surface-to-air missiles, 9K-33 OSA air defense missiles, AK-360 close-in 30mm cannons, chaff, decoys, and electronic defense systems. However, no one recorded the Moskva using any of these systems against the Ukrainian cruise missiles. The ship just sat there. Why were none of these systems active? Was the ship's radar system defective? We might never know the answer. Whatever the reason, the Moskva was the largest Russian vessel sunk since World War II and the first loss of a Russian flagship since the Russo-Japanese War. Russia says that 18 crew members died. Other sources say it was as many as 600. Either way, the incident shocked the Kremlin, with Ukraine's demonstrated anti-ship capabilities and no way for it to bring replacements thanks to the Turks' invocation of the Montreux Convention, Russia became even more cautious about how it would use its naval assets. Since this incident, the Black Sea Fleet has been bottled up around its base in Sevastopol, Crimea. With this knowledge, Ukrainian troops confidently strode forward with their Kherson counteroffensive between August and November of 2022 safe in the knowledge that the Russian Navy would not be bothering them with missile attacks from the Black Sea, let alone amphibious operations behind their lines. Even with the Russian Navy's retreat to the relatively safe Crimea, Ukraine wasn't done showing off its prowess in sinking ships. Next up was the rescue tug for Sili Bek. While far less spectacular a target than the Moskva, these tugs are important to the maintenance of a naval fleet. This role is especially important in the Black Sea due to Russia's inability to reinforce its fleet this ship was new, too, being launched in 2016 and commissioned in 2017. On June 17, 2022, Ukrainian forces attacked the Vasily Bek when it was on its way to resupply Russian soldiers stationed on Snake Island, a place already made famous from the start of the war when the garrison there used colorful language in response to Russia's demands for surrender. The Ukrainians hit the Vasily Bek with two Harpoon anti-ship cruise missiles. The ship stood no chance and went down. With about 10 Russian KIA in the incident, 
and a $25 million Tor air defense system on board that was supposed to be placed on the island. On June 30th, Russia evacuated its garrison from Snake Island. Moscow claimed that this move was an act of goodwill in recognition of a humanitarian corridor that was part of its grain export deal with Ukraine. In reality, Russia evacuated its troops from Snake Island because the attack on the Vasily Bek made its military brass realize that it's too risky to reinforce and resupply the outpost. It was a tacit admission that Russia had ceded the Black Sea west of Crimea to Ukraine. But the Ukrainians weren't done yet. The Olenogorsky Gorniak, a Rapucha-class landing ship, was Ukraine's next target. On August 4, 2023, Ukraine used drone boats to swarm the ship and its neighbors when it was docked in the Black Sea port of Novorossiysk. Not all the drones made it through Russian defenses, but the attack on the Olenogorsky Gorniak succeeded. The ship did not sink, but it needed to be put in a dry dock to repair the heavy damage. It's unlikely that the ship will return to action anytime soon. The water drone Ukraine used in the attack was a new, low-visibility grey boat that can be operated via remote control. The drone boat has a high payload, able to carry a 300kg warhead up to a range of 800 kilometers. The boat also features a satellite communications array at its rear. A Ukrainian operator of these drones explained their low profile was designed to exploit weaknesses in Russian ship defenses. It was an adaptation from their earlier attacks, where Russian ships spotted drone boats and sank them with artillery and small arms fire once they got to within visual range. The attack on the Olenogorsky Gorniak reveals that Ukraine has absorbed these lessons and is adapting with its newer drone boats. Russia claims that it foiled a similar attack on an oil facility after this incident, but as always these claims should be treated with skepticism. Most recently, Ukraine attacked targets in Sevastopol, the headquarters of Russia's Black Sea Fleet, and other targets in Crimea. On September 13th, Ukrainian forces struck the Sergo Ordzonikidze shipyard in Sevastopol, a major repair base. Ukraine reportedly used 10 Franco-British Storm Shadow cruise missiles in the attack. Russia's Ministry of Defense claims that air defense systems in the area shot seven of these missiles down, but that effort was clearly not enough. The Russian Kilo-class diesel-electric submarine Rostov-on-Don and the large landing ship Minsk were struck and destroyed by the Storm Shadows. Key infrastructure on the base was also damaged in this incident. However, the missile attack was only the climax of the operation. Other units were essential for shaping it. Prior to the attack, Ukrainian special operators seemed to have destroyed one of Russia's nearby S-400 air defense systems and took control of an oil facility that housed a local radar unit. By downing these systems, the Ukrainians set the stage for the strike on Sevastopol. It would only be the first of several attacks on Crimean targets in the weeks ahead. On September 14th, Ukraine again struck at the Russian Navy on the seas. Its general staff said it had targeted two ships in the Western Black Sea and released a video showing a Russian patrol ship appearing to come under attack by drone boats. The Russian Ministry of Defense confirmed that one of its ships, the Sergei Kotov, had been attacked but repelled the assault. Meanwhile, that same day, Ukrainian forces used cruise missiles and drones to destroy a Russian air defense network in the Crimean city of Yevpatoria. Then, on September 22nd, Ukraine launched another attack on Sevastopol. Ukraine sent several Storm Shadow cruise missiles at targets there. Russia claims that it shot most of them down, but one made it through, hitting the Black Sea Fleet's headquarters. The attack set the main building ablaze, and Russian officials said at least one service member went missing in the aftermath. Ukraine alleges that the strike was timed to coincide with a meeting of high-level Russian officials. Kirillo Budanov, Ukraine's intelligence chief, says that two Russian commanders were badly injured in the attack. Later, Ukraine's special operations forces said the strike had killed Viktor Sokolov, the commander of Russia's Black Sea Fleet, along with 33 others. No independent source verified this claim, however. Sokolov reportedly attended a soccer awards ceremony to prove he was not dead on September 27th, although there are claims that this was a duplicate. As always, we should know more in time. What we do know is that the Institute for the Study of War confirmed an attack on the 744th Communications Center of the Command of the Black Sea Fleet in Crimea. And the problems are only piling on for Russia. In late September, the Biden administration seemingly finally gave Ukraine what it has wanted for so long. Although it was not officially announced, it's likely that Ukraine will be getting ATAC-M's missiles in the near future. These weapons can hit targets up to 300 kilometers away, 50 kilometers further than the Storm Shadow. And unlike the Storm Shadow, which requires a riskier launch from a fighter jet, 
ATAC-Ms can be fired from Ukraine's HIMARS platforms on the ground. ATAC-Ms would be ideal for launching attacks on Sevastopol. Meanwhile, if Ukraine gets ATAC-Ms, it's also possible that Germany will agree to supply Ukrainians with Taurus air-launched cruise missiles that have even greater range than ATAC-Ms. This weapon system would be ideal for targeting the Kerch Bridge, connecting Crimea to the Russian mainland. A drone attack already damaged the Kerch Bridge a year ago. This scenario would be far more threatening. Ukraine has renewed its attacks on Crimea for a few reasons. First, Russia has allowed the grain export deal that Turkey and the UN brokered in July 2022 to expire. Russia's Black Sea fleet has resumed its blockade of such exports, making it a more important target for Ukraine to destroy. Crimea is also the linchpin of Russia's logistics in Ukraine. Being able to resupply its troops from Crimea is vital to the Russian war effort. Ukrainian disruption of Russian Navy logistics from Crimea is one of the reasons why Moscow now considers it too dangerous to send ships to the west of the peninsula. An attack on Russia's ports in Crimea would disrupt the supply chain to all the branches of Russia's military, and it appears that the Black Sea Fleet is helpless in stopping such attacks. Crimea is also a highly political target, with Ukrainian President Zelensky saying that this war started in Crimea and will end in Crimea. The recapture of Crimea would be the greatest victory for the Ukrainian military, a highly symbolic measure of its triumph. The stakes are just as high, or even higher, for Putin. Prior to the invasion of Ukraine, he sold his occupation and annexation of Crimea to the Russian public as his crowning foreign policy achievement. If Russian occupation of Crimea becomes untenable through missile and drone attacks, and supplying the Russian forces in other parts of Ukraine from Crimea also becomes untenable, Putin's political position at home erodes, and the entire Russian war effort risks breaking down. The war has already put Russia through isolation, economic hardship, and hundreds of thousands of casualties. If Russia cannot gain anything from the hostilities and winds up losing Crimea too, or if it at least cannot use the peninsula for strategic purposes, it's difficult to see how Putin would be able to remain in power, which he plans to do until at least 2036. In this scenario, Russian elites may decide that the time is right for their country to finally get a new leader. There is a presidential election in Russia in 2024. Although elections in Russia are only formalities, the 2024 election could serve as a pretext to oust Putin from power if the war goes too poorly between now and then. It's understandable why Crimea and the Black Sea Fleet would become an increasingly high priority for Ukraine. All wars are first and foremost political. Even if things don't turn out that way, Ukraine's effective neutralization of the Russian Black Sea Fleet is an astounding military achievement. Early in the war, Ukraine forced the Black Sea Fleet to retreat to what it believed was the safety of Crimea. Now, through the actions of its intelligence units, special operators, and missile and air units, it's showing that not even Crimea is safe. If ATAC-Ms and Taurus missiles soon arrive, that point will only be made clearer. What do you think will come next in the war at sea? Will Ukraine soon use ATAC-Ms missiles to destroy Russian ships and docks in Sevastopol? Is the Kerch Bridge safe for Russia? Let us know what you think in the comments. Also, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Why is Putin afraid to deploy the Su-57 to Ukraine? Maybe because much like its land-based counterpart, the T-14 Armata, it's one of the most oversold and disappointing assets within the Russian military. Then there's the fact that Ukraine has been successfully shooting down so many Russian jets that Putin is terrified of his shiny new toy being captured and having its true RCS revealed by the West, as well as the release of any other advanced capabilities, or lack thereof. Let's dive in. When it comes to recent Russian military equipment, there are two things to remember. First, don't believe the hype. And second, make sure your accountant checks the numbers. One of the most overhyped and underwhelming members of the new Russian military is the Su-57 fighter, codenamed Felon by NATO. That codename may be its coolest feature. It promises a lot but delivers much less. What's even more surprising is the way that Russia has been shielding this aircraft from potential risk in the skies near Ukraine. We say near since there's no evidence yet that Russia has risked flying the aircraft anywhere but within Russian airspace, except for a very few brief appearances over much less dangerous Syrian airspace. During those brief deployments in 2018, the Su-57 was still considered a prototype and was described by aviation expert and author Tom Cooper as 
burdened with inadequate and incomplete sensors, incomplete fire control systems, and self-protection suites, no operational integrated avionics, and unreliable engines. Despite its clean lines, impressive maneuverability, and eye-catching paint schemes, this aircraft falls short in many vital areas, including less than stellar stealth capabilities. Its use of outdated engines, a reliance on less than state of the art computer systems, and extremely limited production numbers. Much like the more capable US made F 22 Raptor and F 35 Lightning stealth fighters, the Su 57 ran into extensive development delays and cost overruns. But unlike the F 22 and F 35, the final aircraft has not lived up to pre production hype. Actually, we can go as far as to say the Su 57 isn't even comparable. To the F-22 and F-35. Here's why. The design and layout of the Sukhoi Su-57 Felon is an evolution of the previous Soviet Union's Su-27 shape, adapted for the requirements of low visibility and supersonic speed and agility. In many Western circles, the Su-57 has been described as a stealth flanker, the flanker being the NATO designation for the Su-27. Both planes are twin-engine, twin-tailed planes, with an emphasis on being multi-role aircraft, meaning they can handle both air superiority roles as well as being able to strike ground targets with onboard munitions. The Su-57 began development in the early 2000s and has been delayed several times. Its original prototype was expected to make its maiden flight back in the year 2007, but numerous problems with its design have caused equally numerous delays. While its engines are essentially the same as those of the aircraft it's designed to replace, the Su-35S, their implementation has not gone well. At first, the Russians refused to acknowledge that their new jet had a development problem. Finally, in late 2009, the Russians admitted that problems with the engine were causing the delays. The original concept for the Su-57 was for the plane to use the newly designed and more powerful Isdel I-30 engines. However, nearly all the prototypes and production models released so far are equipped with the same engine used on the existing Su-35S, the AL-41 engine. The reason the ISDL I-30 engines haven't been used yet is due to reliability and quality control issues, which have yet to be ironed out. Beyond those problems, both the AL-41 and the ISDL I-30 are nothing more than a slightly updated and heavier version of the AL-31 engine, which was designed back in the 1970s. That the Su-57, designed to be the best frontline fighter for the latter half of the 2020s, Flying with what are effectively 50-year-old engine designs is just one of the plane's troubles. The other problem that carries over from the earlier AL-31 engine is its propensity for catching fire. The Russian plane that sported the majority of these engines, the MiG-31, has a history of crashes due to engine fires, and the AL-41 used in the Su-57 seems to have inherited that engine fire gene. The very first serial production example, Su-57, crashed in 2019. Due to what Russian state-run media outlet RIA Novosti said was a mishap occurred during an engine test, or a potential failure in the Su-57's engine control system, but Russian news agency TASS reported that it was a flight control system error. This possible engine fire followed one of the Type's T-50 prototypes that was badly damaged due to an engine fire in 2014. These engine problems, along with unanticipated structural fatigue in the fuselage and wings, caused a redesign that included more carbon fiber material, a reinforced airframe, and an enhanced wingspan. These additions raised the overall weight of the Su-57 to more than 25 tons, which further reduced its performance on its older engine models, and led to additional crashes during testing. These changes and additions delayed the expected first delivery model from 2015 all the way to 2020. The Su-57 was expected to be Russia's entry into what's known as a fifth-generation fighter. These types of planes, including the earlier US-made F-117, more of a stealth testbed than an actual fifth-gen fighter, and the much more advanced F-22 Raptor, introduced several new concepts into the aviation industry. These new benchmarks included advanced stealth, or in the case of the Su-57, stealthier, airframes with reduced radar cross-section RCS. Active Electronically Scanned Array AESA, radar, a type of phased array antenna, and supercruise capabilities, which means a fighter can fly above Mach 1 without using afterburners. In comparison, the US-made F-22 is able to cruise at speeds of Mach 1.5 or greater without the use of afterburners for extended periods in combat configuration. 
The SU57 does hit most of the 5th gen benchmarks reasonably well, however it's in the realm of stealth capability that the SU57 has been heavily criticised. It certainly falls far short of its US counterparts when compared against the F-22 and F-35. Russian aviation expert Pyotr Batowski points out in his book Russia's Warplanes Volume 1 that the primary means of reducing radar visibility is to carry normally wing or belly-mounted munitions in the interior of the plane. External weapons and extra fuel tanks, along with the racks with which they are attached to the plane, dramatically increase the radar cross-section of a plane. Mounting those internally removes those obstructions, but the improvement comes at a cost. For one, it means the plane can carry fewer of these add-ons, while it also means the airframe must be bigger and wider, which leads to an increased weight, which requires a more powerful engine, or in the SU-57's case, dual engines. That double-engine design also means the plane is more susceptible to infrared heat-seeking missiles. It also means the external exhaust nozzles increase the radar cross-section on their own. That problem can be countered by embedding the exhaust within the body of the airframe, which both the F-22 and F-35 do remarkably well, but the Su-57 doesn't even try to hide its dual exhausts, making it more observable to enemy detection. There's also the need to deal with the straight lines for the engine intakes, as well as the turbine blades just inside those air ducts. Again, the F-22 and F-35 have been designed not just with embedded fan blades, making them almost undetectable by enemy radar, but the intakes are also covered in radar-absorbent material. The Su-57 employs radar blockers to reduce reflections from the engine inlet guide vanes and are installed in the engine air intake ducts, but they don't do enough to remove that radar return. The shape of the airframe has been designed to reduce the number of directions in which electromagnetic waves are reflected, including blending the wings into the airframe's body, which helps increase the plane's stealthiness. But there are other problems with the plane that add to its lack of stealthiness. One glaring problem is that the entire plane isn't coated in radar-absorbent materials, which the F-22 and F-35 have. The Su-57 does have a paint job that many warplane simulation enthusiasts think is really awesome and super cool looking, but it does nothing to hide the plane from enemy radar. What's even worse is that the Su-57 has exposed rivets all across the plane, especially on its wings. Those dramatically increase the plane's radar signature, making the plane stand out in real combat. The Russian-leaning website MilitaryWatchMagazine.com, always quick to criticize Western military technology while simultaneously lauding Russian ones, claims the Su-57 is built with a unique blend of low-reflectivity fiberglass, which was offered as a beneficial alternative to the more radar-absorbent stealth coatings used on US and Chinese stealth aircraft, due to its much lower maintenance needs. But the number of problems with this type of an airframe, as seen in the efforts to strengthen and improve the plane after it was supposed to be ready for combat trials, shows that this method of construction presents its own inherent weaknesses. The plane's manufacturer Sukhoi claims the Su-57 has an optimal radar cross-section between 0.1 to 1 square meters. For comparison, the F-117 had a radar cross-section of around 0.003, about one-third as much as an ordinary bird while the F-35 has an RCS of 0.005 and the F-22 has an RCS of 0.001, which is somewhere around 1,000 to 10,000 times smaller than the Su-57's RCS. In comparison, a B-52 bomber has a radar cross-section rating of 100, an Su-27 has a rating of 15, an F-16, flying clean, meaning without external weapons and fuel tanks, has a 5, a MiG-21 has a 3, an F-16C has a 1.2, an F-A-18 has a 1.0, and the SR-71 Blackbird has a 0.01, which is about the same as an average bird. The F-35's radar cross-section has been compared to a hummingbird, while the F-22's cross-section has been compared to that of a bumblebee. To understand the real-world difference, Russia's standard surface-to-air system, the S-400, uses a 91N6E search radar, which has a detection range of about 240 miles against a target of 4 square meters. If it's operating under optimal conditions, it should be able to detect an F-15 at 325 miles, an F-A-18E Super Hornet around 1 square meter RCS, at 170 miles, the Su-57 assuming 0.1 square meter RCS at 96 miles, and an F-22 or an F-35 with an RCS of 0.005 or less at only around 17 miles. 
In short, a radar would have between 6 to 10 times greater detection range against the Su-57 compared to an F-22 or an F-35. Russia's problem is that many Western analysts don't believe that the 0.1 RCS that the plane's manufacturer Shukhoi claims to have is accurate. If it's found to be closer to 1 or even higher, then its capabilities as a stealth fighter dramatically decrease, which means bad things for Russia's ability to sell the plane overseas to its usual markets like India and China. All of this leads to the question, if the Russians are so positive the Su-57 is the equal of the F-22 and is the best aircraft Russia has ever built, why are they so reluctant to use it in the current invasion of Ukraine? It's been a glaring issue for the Russian military that they haven't yet established air control over the Ukrainian battlefield, something that their much larger air force was intent on demonstrating from the earliest days of the fighting. The answer is a simple one, though with complicated ramifications. Russia doesn't want to fly one of its very limited number of state-of-the-art aircraft for fear of having it shot down. The risk of having the Su-57 captured and thereby having its true RCS revealed by the West, as well as the release of any other advanced capabilities or lack thereof, is one reason why Russia has been so reluctant to deploy the plane over Ukrainian territory. For a country that has a much smaller and more outdated air force, Ukraine has done a remarkable job of shooting down Russian aircraft and helicopters. As of March 2023, Ukraine had shot down 70 Russian fighter aircraft, at the loss of only 60 of their own. And that's not including one disastrous day for Russia, when on May 15, 2023, they lost two fighter jets, an Su-34 and an Su-35, plus two Mi-8 helicopters, all within 12 hours, and all within the Russian territory of Bryansk. The fact that Russia lost multiple downed aircraft within Russian territory all at the same time was a stunning blow to their air force. Some Western analysts believe Ukrainian air defense systems might have been pushed closer to the border with Russia to engage aircraft that direct their attacks from within Russian borders. The Russian Air Force has recently begun using more glide munitions, which are bombs with pop-out fins that can strike targets at a greater distance. Ukrainian Air Force spokesman Yuri Enat explained after the May 15th incidents that Russian airplanes regularly attack Ukraine from Russian territory. He said their strike air group attacked Ukraine from the north from Bryansk Oblast. They do this almost every day. They carry out strikes with guided bombs. Another black day for Russian military aviation was June 24, 2023, the day of the abortive rebellion by Yevgeny Prigozhin's Wagner mercenary group. In less than 24 hours, Prigozhin's men managed to shoot down seven combat helicopters, as well as one of Russia's most valuable air assets, an IL-22M airborne command post. It is believed that all of the pilots and personnel on board the eight aircraft were lost. The fact that all of these planes were within Russian airspace shows just how dangerous the invasion against Ukraine has been for the Russian Air Force. The open-source combat tracker Oryx says that the Russian aircraft losses are even higher, confirming that they've lost, at a minimum, 77 fixed-wing aircraft as of July 14, 2023, with another 90 helicopters lost. Oryx's numbers are based only on confirmed losses, so the total number of Russian airplanes lost is almost certainly even higher. Another of the major problems with the Su-57 is that there just aren't very many of them available for the Russian Air Force. The West's best estimates are that Russia has only received somewhere between 5 and 15 of the aircraft, with most analysts suggesting Russia is currently flying a total of only 12 felons. Even TASS, the Russian news agency, says a best-case scenario would see Russia possibly receiving as many as 76 Su-57s, but only by the end of 2028. And that's assuming a big ramp-up of production that Russia's economy doesn't appear likely to meet. These numbers pale in comparison to the number of F-22 Raptors that the US currently has flying, which includes 142 combat aircraft and another 44 used for training and testing new equipment and upgrades. Even more impressive is the number of F-35 Lightnings currently flying. The US alone is operating more than 450 F-35s in its three configurations, the original A version, the vertical short takeoff and landing, VSTOL B version, and the carrier C version. But the F-35's true advantage is the ability to sell these aircraft to America's allies. When you include those countries, there are currently more than 850 F-35s in service around the world and the US is producing another 156 more of these planes every year. One of the problems that Russia has had in producing the Su-57 has been a lack of overseas partners. One of its original allies in this program was going to be India, 
who had agreed with Russia back in 2016 to create an improved Su-57 that would have been called the Fifth Generation Fighter Aircraft Program, or FGFA. But years of delays and concerns that the FGFA would not meet project goals led India to put the program on indefinite hold in 2018. India complained that the base Su-57 was too expensive, poorly engineered, and powered by old and unreliable engines. The degree with which India was unhappy with the Su-57 is borne out by the fact that India willingly walked away from the project after already dropping $295 million into pre-development costs, money they'll never get back. With India's departure from the program, Russia lost the largest potential buyer of any future Su-57 aircraft, which meant that Russia will have to bear the cost of developing and producing the aircraft alone. Another potential buyer, Algeria, has a contract to acquire Su-57s in 2025, but that deal may also fall through because Russian firms will not risk having them flight-tested on site in Algeria. And Algeria doesn't trust Russia, to be honest, about any tests done in Russian airspace. Instead of working with Russia for its next aircraft, India has announced an agreement to buy the fourth-gen Rafale fighter from France and has placed an order for 26 of the aircraft, as well as three Scorpene-class submarines. These purchases show how far India has gone to diversify its armaments purchases, while also distancing itself from Russian arms manufacturers. China has already said no to the Su-57, as it's developing its own fifth-gen stealth fighter, the J-20 Super Dragon, which itself will eventually be replaced by an even better model, their as-yet-unnamed sixth-gen advanced stealth fighter, which is still under development and not expected to see full production until sometime after 2026. Then there's Russia's failed export sale of existing Su-35 planes to Iran. They had a deal in place for Iran to purchase up to 50 already built Su-35s, an agreement concluded in 2014 during the second term of President Hassan Rouhani. According to a former Iranian diplomat, at the time of purchase Russia had promised to deliver the Su-35s in 2023, but neither Iran nor Russia is expecting the planes to be delivered this year. Whether the unexpected loss of so many aircraft in the Ukraine invasion is to be blamed for this delay, or as some have speculated, Israel was able to dissuade Russia from sending Iran the planes, is still a matter of speculation. Either way, not sending aircraft that have already been paid for sends a strongly negative signal to any other potential buyers of Russian armaments. Which leads us to our next question, posed by many Western commentators. Is the Su-57 actually the worst stealth fighter in any modern air force? When taking into account its comparatively poor RCS, its unreliable engines, its pitifully small production numbers, and its reliance on fiberglass framing instead of stealth coating, it seems that it's not really even comparable to the current best stealth aircraft, the F-22 and the F-35, and might even be considered less satisfactory than the Chinese J-20, which seems to many analysts to be a pirated copy of the F-22 Raptor built with stolen technology. Henry Kelsall, military analyst and aviation expert, says, Russia's Su-57 Felon is a troubled aircraft and a poor stealth fighter, with an abnormally high radar cross-section and just 10 in active service. He adds, it's an aircraft that should have stealth capabilities, but the Su-57 falls remarkably short in this area. Aircraft such as the F-22 Raptor and F-35 Lightning II have it beaten in this department. As such, it's arguable that the Su-57 is the world's worst stealth aircraft currently in service. Russian President Vladimir Putin, on the other hand, seems to be willing to claim it's not only not that bad, but that the Felon is the best stealth fighter in the world. This is the world's best plane by all its operational characteristics and its armament, Putin said about the Su-57, according to a report broadcast by Russian news agency TASS. No other aircraft in the world can fly as well as our plane. This is the true reason why Russia can't afford to have one of their few Su-57s shot down. If the West were to get their hands on a shot-down felon and discover, as many analysts have pointed out, that this plane is nothing more than a souped-up fourth-gen fighter, then its chances of ever being sold to overseas buyers would vanish in a heartbeat. The aviation writer, ex-Marine and foreign policy and defense technology analyst Alex Hollings says, The Su-57 isn't quite as advanced, quite as capable, or quite as stealthy as the other three fighters of its generation. As far as their effectiveness in the Ukraine invasion, he added, to date, there are so few Su-57s in existence that any capability they offer the Russian military is superficial at best. Russia will likely keep the Felon within its own territory and will only operate it when the plane is out of Ukrainian surface-to-air missile range, which is from 60 to 90 miles. 
A shootdown of the vaunted Su-57 would be a terrible blow to Russia and a public relations bonanza for the Ukrainians and its allies in the West. So whether its stealthiness is as bad as its many detractors suggest, the Su-57 Felon is one plane that Ukraine will probably never see flying through the skies. But what do you think? Will Putin ever send the Su-57 into battle? If so, do you think it will live up to the hype he's generated around it? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Imagine that it's the year 2030. NATO forces operating somewhere near the Baltic coastline have come across a truly frightening sight. The Russian forces on the opposite end of no man's land are outfitted in body armor, which makes them look like a unit of robocops. Their faces are covered with an intimidating helmet and visor that gives them an edge in the information domain. Their chests and all of their extremities are protected by overlapping bullet-resistant plates. To make matters worse, their armor also has an integrated exoskeleton that increases their strength, speed, and endurance. The protective power of their armor is also unparalleled. Even 50 caliber Browning machine gun rounds don't have enough stopping power to put these guys down. What's a NATO unit to do in the face of such fearsome enemies? Well, not much, because this scenario is likely to be as imaginary as anything that Hollywood can produce. Meet the Sotnik, Russia's next-generation body armor that worried defense officials and military experts when it was unveiled. If it works as advertised, there is reason indeed to be worried, but it probably won't. And there is a long history of Russian body armor failures to believe that it won't. Before Russia invaded Ukraine, defense and foreign policy analysts regarded its military as the second most capable fighting force in the world. It had demonstrated its post-Soviet prowess with experience in Chechnya in the 1990s and 2000s, Georgia in 2008, and Ukraine in 2014, when it rapidly secured control of Crimea. It was also a fearsome military. Experts remembered the devastation the Russian Air Force and artillery units had brought to the Chechen city of Grozny during multiple battles in the 1990s. Aside from the Kremlin building a formidable artillery-based land force that would be resilient against air attacks, experts also touted Russia's new, technologically advanced weapon systems. These platforms included the new fifth-generation Su-57 fighter jet and the T-14 Armata main battle tank, which was supposedly more advanced than any other tank in foreign arsenals. However, when Russia launched the invasion, these theories quickly got tossed to the winds. The supposedly fearsome Russian war machine proved hard-pressed to supply itself over even short distances. The T-14 and Su-57 were almost nowhere to be seen, and Russian soldiers found themselves bogged down in a costly war of attrition, suffering from poor command doctrine and Western weapons like the Javelin and HIMARS, which proved so devastating to their supposedly latest and greatest gear. Even the venerable Patriot air defense system, which first came online in the 1980s, was able to knock one of Russia's ultra-modern Kinzhal hypersonic missiles, which Vladimir Putin had once touted as invincible, out of the sky. Now the Russian military is boasting about its next-generation body armor, the Sotnik. If it delivers as promised, it will protect its wearer better than any other body armor system in the world, but like most Russian boasting, there's a lot of hype about the Sotnik and not a whole lot of facts. Since 2016, Russian troops have worn the Ratnik 2 body armor system, accompanied by the 6B45 helmet. The Ratnik's vest has an effective area protection that is larger than most other body-comparable armor systems. Based on a material similar to Kevlar, the Ratnik covers 90% of a soldier's body, and its granite ceramic plates can withstand 10 sniper rifle shots from a distance of only 10 meters. It is a good system to protect against shrapnel and explosive fragments too. The Ratnik's overalls protect the entire body from these flying pieces of metal and other debris. Ratnik 2 takes care to protect the groin and extremities like the hands. The 6B45 helmet, meanwhile, covers an area of 30 square decimeters with effective protection. Despite this, the helmet remains light at only 1 kilogram, which means that Russian military personnel can attach various instruments to it without adding undue strain on their necks. Such equipment includes thermal and night vision monoculars, flashlights, and a communication system with specialized headphones. Perhaps most impressively, the Ratnik 2 body armor has an electromagnetic camouflage system that shields its wearer from infrared sensors. The armor weighs between 40 and 50 pounds, but some of the weight is relieved by a passive carbon fiber exoskeleton. 
The exoskeleton also protects its wearer's spine and joints from the gradual wear and tear that lugging around such heavy weight will do to a person over time. This exoskeleton does not need an external power source to function. Ratnik is supposed to be getting an upgrade too. In 2020, Russia announced it would be developing its Ratnik 3 body armor system. This version would include an integrated exoskeleton, a helmet visor-mounted target designation system, stealth fabric, anti-mine boots, a vision system via electric goggles that would allow soldiers to link up with the camera views of small drones and see tactical orders or maps of the broader area, and an anti-thermal and anti-radar camouflage suit. The integrated exoskeleton for the Ratnik 3 was getting an upgrade as well. It was reportedly designed to comfortably haul weights of up to 132 pounds during combat operations. In 2021, American military planners were nervous about these developments. There was the feeling that the United States was lagging behind on body armor and exoskeleton systems for its soldiers and Marines. The revelation of Sotnik made American defense officials and think tanks even more nervous. Now they know better. Unfortunately for Russia, much of the hype about the Ratnik was a bunch of boasts, as we've come to expect by now. In 2017, the Russian army said it had received 200,000 sets of Ratnik 2 body armor. The following year, the Russian Ministry of Defense said it expected that all of its military personnel would be equipped with the Ratnik 2 by 2020. But 2020 came and went, and the Russian military failed in its goal. The invasion of Ukraine proved as such. Instead of getting standard-issue gear, Russian troops fighting in Ukraine, even those in the regular army at the start of the invasion, have had to make do with what body armor they could get. Most of the Ratnik's claims failed to materialize on the battlefield. Complaints about body armor and helmet malfunction have been frequent in the Russian ranks throughout the course of the war. Instead of the new Ratnik, some of the luckier Russian troops have been seen wearing older 6B23 body armor in Ukraine. This armor can be protective against indirect impacts like shrapnel or shell fragments, but lacks the ability to adequately defend its wearer from direct ballistic hits. Even if the enemy gunshots fail to penetrate the 6B23, the armor cannot easily disperse the energy the impacting bullets transfer to the human body. Broken bones and internal trauma were frequently reported among those who wore 6B23 body armor and suffered combat-related injuries. These shortcomings are what prompted the Kremlin to replace the 6B23 with the Ratnik family of armors in the first place. However, complete Ratnik armors were few and far between on the battlefields of Ukraine. What happened? Typical corruption within the Russian military's ranks has proven part of its body armor failures. In 2021, a Russian captain and ensign were convicted of stealing 56 sets of body armor and selling them online. The captain got a sentence of six years and the ensign got seven years. Both of them are currently serving time in a penal colony. These two may have been made an example of, but they were hardly the only ones. It's common for officers in the Russian military to sell off top-of-the-line gear to line their own pockets, and then issue Cold War-era equipment to the soldiers under their command instead. The Russian military's body armor problems got much worse when Vladimir Putin announced partial mobilization in the fall of 2022, as Ukraine was pushing his forces back in Kharkiv and Kherson, and he desperately needed additional manpower. According to defense intelligence officials in the UK, the conscripts Russia mobilized in late 2022 often had no choice but to buy their own body armor because Russian armories were short. Many of the armor kits that these people and their families wound up buying turned out to be fake too. Those lucky enough to get their hands on real Ratnik armor often wound up becoming victims of theft, as poorly equipped Russian regular troops at the front simply stole it from them. The demand led to a boom in the price of any kind of body armor that even looked real on Russian e-commerce sites. Body armor, and we use that term loosely in this context, can now fetch up to $650 a piece online in Russia. This is a price that most of the soldiers in Ukraine and their families cannot afford, especially because a disproportionate amount of the people conscripted to fight in the autumn of 2022 came from Russia's poorer ethnic minority communities. Ukrainian soldiers who have captured body armor worn by Russian soldiers on the battlefield have often found such gear fitted with cheap steel plates instead of the high-tech ceramics, which are now designed to slow the bullet down to reduce its impacting force. The ceramic plates in high-quality body armor like the American Interceptor also fracture and deform the bullet itself as it impacts the vest. This fracturing and deforming in turn distributes the bullet's energy over a wider area to protect the wearer against blunt force trauma. 
while some armies use steel instead of ceramics in their body armor, this steel is extremely tensile and specially manufactured to stand up to small arms ballistics. The captured steel plates in Ukraine, though, have proven little match for small arms fire. Standard 9mm parabellum rounds were shown to puncture the steel plates on videos posted to social media by Ukrainian soldiers. Rifle rounds easily did the job. They are little more than steel sheets stolen from somewhere else and fitted into what was supposed to be body armor. Captured Russian body armor also seemed to be little more than a cloth covering to hold the faulty steel plates in place. This is in contrast to Western body armor, which is made from Kevlar and other fabrics engineered to be resistant to small arms fire and shrapnel or explosive fragments. The Russian armor, meanwhile, seemed like it would only be good against fragments or shrapnel in the area that the plates directly covered. Indeed, Ukrainian troops have been seen on video bending the steel plates in captured Russian body armor with their hands, feet, and over their knees. They laugh contemptuously as they do so. This equipment is probably not official Ratnik armor, but rather knockoffs sold on Russian e-commerce sites. However, one Russian conscript even complained on video that he was given a vest that would only be effective against an airsoft gun. It turns out that the Russian logistics brass opted to buy the toy replicas of Ratnik armor for their mobilized soldiers and pocketed the rest of the money allocated to them. Even if Russian soldiers or conscripts are lucky enough to get their hands on legitimate Ratnik armor, it is often not a complete kit. Corruption is so widespread in the Russian military that the ceramic plates inside the Ratnik vests are often missing, either to cut costs or because they are valuable commodities to sell off in their own right. Corrupt Russian logistics officers instead sold off the ceramics and replaced them with the cheap, non-ballistic steel plates that Ukrainian soldiers made fun of in the videos. The lack of effective body armor in Ukraine has proven devastating for the Russian war effort. At the end of August 2023, the Pentagon released estimates which painted a grim picture for the Russians. According to the US military, total Russian casualties over the 18-month war were approaching the 300,000 mark. This total included about 120,000 dead and 170 to 180,000 combat-related injuries. Ukraine, meanwhile, was suffering too, with 70,000 KIA and between 100 and 120,000 wounded. However, the Russians outnumber the Ukrainians by nearly 3 to 1 on the battlefields of Ukraine. There are many reasons for this disparity in casualties despite Russia's manpower advantage, but the lack of proper body armor is a big one. The Russian body armor industry is in such a poor state that the military is now turning to Chinese equipment to make up for its shortcomings. China has been reluctant to provide military aid to Russia for fear of Western sanctions, but some Chinese firms have been supplying their beleaguered strategic partner with weapons and equipment through backdoor means. Such aid includes body armor. 12 tons worth of Chinese body armor were routed to Russia through Turkey in late 2022. The body armor came from companies such as Xingxing Guangzhou Import and Export Company. Chinese companies have also sent component parts to Russian body armor manufacturers like Klass, although it's not currently understood how widespread the Klass vests have been used in Ukraine. Ukrainian soldiers have captured Klass vests on the battlefield too, although it's also unclear if these contain Chinese component parts. Ukrainian troops have been known to sell these captured materials online. Chinese body armor has been tested by American defense officials. This type of body armor uses aramid fibers, which are the same kind of fibers found in the familiar Kevlar vests used in the United States and other Western militaries. In the tests, the Chinese body armor's ceramic plates succeeded in stopping standard small arms fire, such as the 7.62 mm round, from penetrating. However, the plates showed significant deformation. The deformation indicates that soldiers wearing this armor would suffer from blunt force trauma if struck by enemy fire because the energy would not be dispersed over a wide enough area. If Russian troops are looking to this equipment to save them, they will probably wind up being disappointed. So as with many other aspects of its military, Russian body armor looks great on parade grounds and in the Kremlin's information networks. On the battlefield, not so much, and the results in Ukraine show it. For Russia, Anything that can go wrong does seem to go wrong, thanks to institutional incompetence on every conceivable level. Now Russia has plans for its next generation body armor, the Sotnik system, which the Kremlin says will come online in 2025, replacing the Ratnik family of armors. The armor was unveiled in early 2021, 
about a year before the invasion of Ukraine, the armor developed by Russia's state Rostec Corporation would be the most advanced and protective body armor in the world, if it works as advertised. But what have we come to learn about Russia's military's claims by now? According to Rostec, the Sotnik armor would be capable of protecting its wearer against small arms fire and even a direct hit from the 50 caliber Browning machine gun round, which can pierce lightly armored vehicles at a range of 2 kilometers. To protect against the shock of incoming rounds like the .50 BMG, which can transfer more than enough energy to kill, even if the bullet does not penetrate the body, the Sotnik armor will be made from ultra-high molecular weight polythene fibers. These fibers will be designed to not restrict a soldier's movement, even with the added protection. This principle works in theory because polythene is a plastic and plastic is light. But this raises a question, how can a plastic protect you against gunfire, let alone a 50 caliber round? As you would expect, plastics melt at high enough temperatures, including the heat a bullet makes as it transfers its energy to a target. The melting fibers adhere to the bullet and slow it down allowing the other parts of the armor to stop it from penetrating and transfer its energy over a broader area. Because of its heavy use of plastics, the total weight of a set of Sotnik armor will supposedly be reduced by 20 pounds from the Ratnik family of armors. All in all, a set of Sotnik body armor will weigh around 44 pounds, according to Rostec. And as if all the cutting-edge technology wasn't enough, Rostec says it will develop an active titanium exoskeleton to integrate with the armor in the future. Rostec is researching power sources for how this feature would work. As early as 2021, however, there were some military and engineering experts who were skeptical about Russian claims. Since ancient times, armor has always been a compromise between protection and mobility. Too much protection leaves a wearer immobile. It's why some units from then to now chose not to wear any body armor at all. For them, mobility was their best protection. Other units preferred to fight with heavier armor because they did not expect to need a lot of mobility. The latest question in this age-old compromise is, can polythene armor capable of stopping a 50 caliber machine gun round be made lightweight enough for a soldier to actually be able to wear it and not be immobile? According to a 2021 analysis in Popular Mechanics, the answer was not promising. For comparison, a standard 7.62mm bullet transfers 1,878 pounds of force on its target. A 50 caliber Browning machine gun round is over four times that, at 11,070. To put that into perspective, this weight would be the same as if a 5-ton truck were sitting on your chest. American military gear can stop standard rifle rounds like 7.62mm, with a total weight on the soldier at 22.6 pounds. This is a good compromise between protection and mobility. Stopping a 50 caliber round is a whole different story, however. That would take 1.25 inches of AR-500 grade steel plate, but this type of steel is far too heavy to comfortably wear. It would make a modern soldier the equivalent of a caricatured version of a medieval knight wearing armor that was too heavy to move around in. The amount of polythene plastic that would be needed to stop a 50 caliber round, even accounting for greater efficiency, would almost certainly be impossible to wear on the battlefield and remain mobile. Popular Mechanics mentioned that Russia could try to compensate for this reality by adding titanium plating to the ensemble of a far more realistic amount of polythene. Since titanium is lighter and stronger than steel, the idea seems feasible. There is also precedent for it. Armorers in the Soviet Union made body armor with titanium components during the Cold War. However, even with this modification, stopping a 50 caliber round and leaving a soldier mobile enough to move around would be very difficult. The verdict about the idea of body armor reliably stopping 50 caliber rounds? Feasible, but don't put your money on it. It's also worth mentioning that 50 caliber machine gun rounds can easily punch holes in cinder block walls. Even if the body armor does stop penetration, dispersing over 11,000 pounds of force safely around the human body would be difficult. The blunt force trauma from the impact of a 50 caliber round would still likely be enough to kill. So even if the logistics to outfit all of Russia's soldiers with Sotnik body armor by 2025 work out, and there is every reason, as we've seen by now, to believe that they won't, the Sotnik still has a long way to go to prove the Kremlin's claims. If we have not learned to doubt those by now, we have not learned anything from the 18-month war in Ukraine. But what do you think about Russia's next generation Sotnik body armor? Does it even have a chance of living up to the claims the Kremlin makes of it? Let us know in the comments. Also, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe.
For more military analysis from military experts. When you break down the T-90 on paper, Russia's most modern battle tank looks pretty fierce. Among other high-tech accessories, it boasts a 125mm smoothbore gun, modular composite armor, and a 1,000-plus horsepower V12 diesel engine. In theory, it offers excellent mobility, protection, and firepower, along with the ability to launch armor-piercing, fin-stabilized, discarding sabot rounds, and anti-tank guided missiles. The T-90 also has several variants and has been a popular export due to its relatively high cost-to-benefit ratio. Then why, you might be wondering, has the T-90 been such an epic failure on the battlefield? To be fair, it's not just the T-90s that are dropping like flies. As Russia's war with Ukraine continues, since February last year, the Russian Armored Corps losses have since reached more than 2,100 tanks. That's around two-thirds of the tanks Russia initially rolled out of Moscow on their way to Kyiv. Russia has lost so many tanks, in fact, that they've had to reactivate and deploy hundreds of older models, including the T-72 Ural, T-62, and T-5455, some of which are 50, 60, even 70 years old. And most of these have headed to the front without any meaningful upgrades, not since the collapse of the Soviet Union anyway, to their optics, fire control systems, or armor. It probably wasn't the first choice, one could imagine, of the boys back at the Kremlin to roll out these older models. This decision likely has something to do with the recent spike in losses of their prized T-90s. In total, Russian troops have been forced to scrap or abandon nearly 60 of these 53-ton, three-person tanks, roughly 15% of Russia's pre-war inventory, with most being lost in only the last few months. But wait, aren't these supposed to be the baddest tanks around? That's certainly what the Kremlin's been saying. Before we get to the specific factors contributing to the T-90's proposed survivability, or lack thereof, let's take a moment to address one other important point. When we zoom out, there's an argument to be made that the increasing number of T-90's being destroyed on the battlefield in Ukraine might actually be a negative sign of things to come for our friends in Kyiv. How's that? Well, let's look at it like this. One reason that so many T-90s have been destroyed recently, but certainly not the only reason, is that there's been more of them deployed to destroy. Translation, Russia's current production of T-90s has been picking up, as Putin's nearly two-year effort to boost tank production finally seems to be paying off. Apparently, Russia has been able to work around some of its increasingly tighter foreign sanctions, including those on critical high-end electronics that it was once importing from France. As mentioned before, the number of destroyed or captured T-90s accounts for roughly a quarter of Russia's pre-war inventory. This overall number, however, does not include the hundreds that have been produced by the Ural Vagonzavod plant in Svedlovsk Oblast since the start of 2022. Russia's increased productivity could become a serious problem for Ukraine, considering its main tank plant, the Malyshev factory in Kharkiv, currently lacks the capacity to produce new tanks from scratch and is limited to performing upgrades and repairs. This leaves Ukraine's armored forces mostly reliant on foreign donations if they intend to deploy a fleet of modern Western-style tanks, which they have, including German Leopard 2s, British Challenger 2s, and the American M1 Abrams. But are foreign donations going to be able to match Russian tank production? Well, it's hard to say, but it probably wouldn't hurt for Ukraine's Western allies to throw in a few more tanks especially because the Ural Vagonzavod plant can, hypothetically, produce enough new T-90s in the next six months to match Ukraine's current inventory of comparable, modern battle tanks. But even if this theory is true, and an increasing number of T-90s are being destroyed largely because more are being manufactured and deployed, that certainly isn't the whole story. The overall effectiveness and functionality of the T-90 has been a matter of debate since the beginning, with many distinguished experts expertly concluding that, overall, the T-90 is a piece of junk. First introduced as the T-72BU, then renamed the T-90 to distinguish it from all the other T-72 variants, the T-90 was thought to be one of the most well-protected tanks in the world, while also boasting one of the most heavily equipped battle systems currently on the market. After being officially brought into service in 1992, the T-90 has received a number of upgrades and subsequent name changes. In 2004, it was renamed the T-90A, and then in 2016, it was upgraded and rebranded again as the T-90M. Then, after its most recent upgrade in 2017, it came to be called the T-90MS. 
There were also less popular variants along the way, but those aren't worth mentioning here. Since its conception, one of the major selling points of the T90 has been its relatively low cost. Save for the most recent variant, the T90MS, which runs closer to $4 million, the full line of older, less expensive T90 models can still be purchased and exported for around $3 million. Even though it continues to be produced primarily for use by the Russian Army's armored division, the Kremlin has sold and exported thousands of T90s, mostly T90S variants, to countries such as Algeria, Armenia, and Iraq. In fact, India alone is now in possession of more than 2,000 Russian-built T90Ss. Underneath the hood, so to speak, of all currently available T90 variants is a V12 diesel engine. The most powerful, coming in at 1,130 horsepower, can be found on the T90MS. The T90 is also about 20 tons lighter than the M1 Abrams, and was designed to accommodate and be operated by, thanks to its auto-loading firing system, just a three-man crew. Upon closer inspection, however, the effectiveness of both the engine and loading system have come into question, but more on that a bit later. So what about firepower? Well, if the T90 has one thing going for it, it definitely has a lot of that. The T90's 2A46M4 125mm smoothbore main gun can fire a range of high-tech ammunition options, including armor-piercing, fin-stabilized discarding sabot rounds, as well as the anti-tank guided missiles mentioned earlier, also known as the 9M119 Reflex, or by NATO as the AT-11 Sniper. These high-tech projectiles have a maximum range of 4,000 meters, with a flight time of 11.7 seconds, and can, under certain conditions, even take down helicopters. Also in terms of firepower, the T-90 features two externally mounted machine guns. One is a 12.7mm cord heavy machine gun that has a cycle rate of fire of 700 to 800 rounds per minute and can be remotely operated from within the tank. The other is a PKMT 7.62mm coaxial machine gun. And when it comes to protection, in addition to conventional armor plating, modern T-90 variants also come equipped with two very high-tech defensive systems. The first is the Shatora-1, an active protection system made by the Russian company Electronic Torg that includes a 360-degree laser warning receiver complete with automatically triggered countermeasures that deploy if the tank is painted by an enemy laser. This device can even orient the tank's main gun in the direction of the laser's origin. The Shatora-1, among other features, also comes with an infrared jammer and a grenade launching system that has the capacity to discharge smoke grenades which release an infrared obscuring aerosol cloud. The modern T-90's second line of defense is its Contact 5 Explosive Reactive Armor, or ERA, which is essentially a layer of high explosive sandwiched between two metal plates designed to minimize the damage of explosive projectiles by detonating just prior to their impact. Pretty fancy, right? ERA was specifically designed to counter a range of advanced weaponry, including missiles and rockets carrying high explosive anti-tank warheads as well as highly deadly sabot rounds, which separate after being fired and turn into a thin, fin-stabilized rod made of depleted uranium. Once a sabot round impacts an enemy tank, the kinetic force it creates while penetrating also creates a steam of molten metal that pours into the cabin with it. This instantaneously increases the temperature and pressure inside of the sealed turret, killing or rather cooking everyone inside. The T-90 also comes with a magnetic mine detection system that, when functioning properly, uses an electromagnetic pulse to disable mines before the tank can run over them. So then, what's the deal, you might be asking? Why aren't these extra fancy protection systems making the T-90s unstoppable? For one, these systems haven't performed so well against long-range anti-tank guided missiles. There was one report that stated a Ukrainian took out two T-90Ms back-to-back using an AT-4 anti-tank weapon. If that report is accurate, this would be a very impressive set of skills. The Swedish-made Saab AT-4, given to the Ukrainians by the US and Sweden, is a lightweight, shoulder-launched anti-armor weapon. However, despite delivering an 84mm projectile out to a range of 300 meters, this unguided weapon should not be effective against a T-90M's reactive armor, which the manufacturers claim is effective against not just low-speed rockets and missiles, but also tank rounds coming in at hypersonic speeds. There are, it seems, even more embarrassing ways to lose a tank, which Russia has also discovered recently. Apparently, a group of Russian technicians accidentally set fire to a T-72 they were attempting to repair. In the confusion, 
The ammunition on board caught fire and exploded, completely destroying the tank and damaging two others nearby. The loss of this tank and the two T-90Ms suggest that a more complex set of problems might be plaguing the Russian military. And this makes the actual durability and effectiveness of the T-90 more difficult to determine. Is the hyped T-90M any less vulnerable than earlier models? It's hard to tell when it's regularly being used without proper tactical or common sense. Another reason the T-90 was poorly conceived compared to other main battle tanks is that its underlying design is outdated. Ultimately, as we mentioned before, the T-90 is simply an improved version of the T-72. Essentially, the turret of the T-80 and the hull and drivetrain of the T-72 combined together and covered over with reactive armor. And because the T-90 is in its essence only an update, it retains all of the defects of its bargain-built older brothers. Its inherent shortcomings, leading to the apparent failure of the T-90's ultra-modern defensive systems, is one thing. But this tank has also been the victim of tactical incompetence and has regularly been rolled into impossible, no-win situations. In modern warfare, advancing tanks are supposed to be supported by infantry for the very purpose of suppressing enemy ground troops who might be using anti-tank weapons, like the AT-4. Deployed armor should also have artillery support, if only to help mitigate any long-range threats. Sending tanks forward without defensive support, as Russia has continued to do in Ukraine, makes them extremely vulnerable, especially to infantry units using shoulder-launched weapons. Mobile ground units, when allowed to get in close, can carry out ambushes at short range, which allows them to focus their attacks on a tank's more vulnerable target areas. A particularly vulnerable area for these tanks that's also been exposed by the creative fighting tactics being used in Ukraine is the roof. So it seems the T-90 has had some trouble with the anti-tank missiles that are fired from elevated positions and ultimately come down onto these vehicles from above. The T-90's 360-degree active protection system is supposed to protect from this sort of attack, and its failure to do so might suggest that this fancy new system isn't as infallible as first advertised. A range of other deficiencies came to light after the first T-90 was captured, intact, from the battlefield in Ukraine. With the tank now safely in their possession, military specialists from the Ukrainian Center for the Study of Captured and Prospective Weapons and Military Equipment were able to conduct an analysis of all internal equipment and armaments and went on to publicly announce their findings in March of 2023. When, around the same time, another T-90A was captured, this one was apparently handed over to the US, also for the purpose of research. But when one of Russia's most modern pieces of armor was spotted on a trailer in Louisiana, then subsequently photographed, a debate surrounding the tank's unlikely appearance on American soil exploded on social media. It isn't fully known what the US ultimately had planned for the tank, but we do know what Ukraine did with theirs. They ripped it apart, literally and figuratively. Once the team of Ukrainian experts had completed their investigation, they claimed to have uncovered little more than an old T-72 hiding beneath the shell of widespread Russian propaganda labeling Russia's new war machine an overall failure and not nearly the breakthrough the Kremlin had been all along claiming it to be. The team of engineers from the Center for the Study of Captured and Prospective Weapons and Military Equipment also noted that the well-praised automatic loader was largely the same design as could be found on the older T-72, the only major difference being that the ammo was now stored in a separate compartment outside the turret this modification, however, created the complication of tankers having to fully exit the vehicle in order to load ammunition into the main compartment, which, to be done with any practical sense or relative amount of safety, would require that the tank leave the field of battle. Talk about taking yourself out of the fight. The center also reportedly discovered significant limitations concerning the T-90's B92S2F V12 diesel engine, which Ukrainian engineers claimed did not have sufficient power to reliably propel the vehicle, a claim that was supported by videos of T-90s getting stuck in the mud. They also noted that the highly praised Kalina computerized fire control system had incorporated in its design not only civilian electronic components, but some of Western origin. While other electronic components had been assembled without adhering to moisture control requirements, resulting in increased oxidation, shortened lifespan, and unexpected failure. But the embarrassment of Russian tank builders isn't the Kremlin's biggest problem here. 
If Ukraine persists in revealing the secrets and vulnerabilities of the allegedly advanced systems and technologies of the T-90, this could potentially create a serious financial challenge for Russia in the future, by giving other countries the information needed to produce their own, while simultaneously diminishing the hype surrounding the Russian-made T-90, sales are bound to diminish. And this is no small sum we're talking about. Russia has currently received a combined total of nearly $10 billion for exported T-90s from India and Algeria alone, but a fair amount of damage seems to have already been done. As reports of the T-90s mediocrity have continued to surface, many foreign companies that had previously signed contracts with Russia have swiftly cancelled those agreements. All these technological and mechanical shortcomings, though, are only part of the bigger story. The lack of success the T-90 has had on the battlefield in Ukraine cannot be truly understood without looking at the opposition they faced. It would be a disservice to Ukraine's ferocious troops to do otherwise. Combined with grit and determination born largely of national pride, Ukrainian forces have also received an impressive amount of anti-tank weaponry from the US as well as other allies. From the US alone, Ukraine has received more than 10,000 Javelin anti-armor systems, 90,000 other anti-armor systems and munitions, 8,000 tube-launched, optically-tracked, wire-guided Tau missiles, 35,000 grenade launchers and small arms, 4 million rounds of small arms ammunition and grenades, and a whole slew of laser-guided rocket systems, rocket launchers, and anti-tank mines. According to Washington's regularly updated list of wartime contributions, which includes 31 Abrams tanks, 45 T-72B tanks, 186 Bradley infantry fighting vehicles, 20 MI-17 helicopters, dozens of combat drones, lots of state-of-the-art satellite communications equipment, and more than 100,000 sets of body armor and helmets, President Biden has provided nearly $44 billion in military assistance to Ukraine thus far. Weapons are a critical part of warfare, that's obvious, but without resourcefulness, they will only take a conventional force so far, which makes the new tactic Ukrainian forces have been using against Russian tanks that much more impressive. To go along with their already proven yet more traditional ambush maneuvers, they've also developed a highly creative yet simple way of utilizing landmines. Essentially, as a Russian mine plow clears a path through a known minefield, Ukrainian troops will wait for it to pass, then toss fresh mines onto the same path right in front and sometimes behind the trailing convoy, effectively littering the cleared corridor with new mines. The vehicles following the mine plow end up hitting these mines or run over the mines as they try to escape the trap. To execute this brazen new maneuver, the Ukrainians have been utilizing two different types of mines. One is the Soviet TM-62, the other is the American Remote Anti-Armor Mine System, or RAM, of which the US has donated more than 30,000. The 21-pound TM-62 is what you think of when you think of a traditional mine, basically a big metal disc packed with explosives and fitted with some sort of fuse. The RAM, on the other hand, is slightly different and consists of nine mines that are four pounds each stacked together in a hollow 155mm artillery shell. With practice, Ukrainian troops have found that a few well-aimed volleys can scatter scores of these, each with a magnetic fuse, across a relatively wide area. This tactic has been a big success recently, as armored vehicles have continued to roll in neat lines across the fields and forests between the Russian-occupied cities of Pavlivka and Volodar. And what often happens, after the lead tank hits a mine and explodes, the rest of the column attempts to scatter. Some vehicles try to go around the wrecked lead vehicle, only to hit a mine themselves. In these scenarios, even retreat is dangerous, as there might be fresh mines now scattered behind the column, littered across the very path it used to come through. In the past weeks, in the region surrounding Volodar, the Russians have lost 30 or more armored vehicles, including a few tanks, and it seems that well-placed mines have largely been the cause. To defeat these tactics and save a few of their prized T-90s, Russia will need, at minimum, better intelligence and a more flexible command and control strategy. In theory, the narrow TM-62 minefields shouldn't be that hard to avoid if the opposing force was able to, let's say, organize 24-hour surveillance and a reliable means of disseminating information to its frontline forces. And Russia will need exactly that if they want to keep ahead of Ukraine's clearly savvy military engineers. But what do you think? 
have the technical shortcomings of the Russian T-90 been the primary cause of its poor performance? Or are these tanks being utilized poorly and judged unfairly? Also, how might foreign military aid and Ukraine's improvised tactics be contributing to the loss of so many Russian tanks? Let us know in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. First tanks and now submarines. Putin can't seem to keep hold of his weapons. With Russia's only aircraft carrier catching fire not once, not twice, but three times since 2018, and his guided missile cruiser the Moskva sinking in 2022, Russia's navy, widely considered one of the most powerful in the world, has seen better days. And now, Russia's submarine power is under serious threat. Here's why. It's no secret that things haven't been going well for Russia, from crushing sanctions to staggering military casualties. Putin's invasion of Ukraine has backfired in a host of unexpected ways. It has also highlighted profound weaknesses in Russia's military capabilities, exposing them as aging, corrupt, and poorly led. Nowhere is this more true than at sea. Despite statements by former Russian President Dmitry Medvedev back in 2009 that, without a navy, Russia does not have a future as a state, the country's surface fleet remains embarrassingly inept. Former US Navy Admiral James G. Foggo recently noted that it has been allowed to atrophy due to factors like poor maintenance, low funding, and corruption. This trend has been on full display during recent years, with the Russian Navy suffering a number of embarrassing high-profile mishaps. Its only aircraft carrier, the Admiral Kuznetsov, nicknamed the unluckiest ship in the world, has caught fire at least three times since 2018. Earlier this year, Ukrainian intelligence assessed that the ship is in critical condition and not capable of moving under its own power. That's not to mention the sinking of Russia's Black Sea flagship, the Moskva, in April 2022. But now there's an even bigger problem for Putin, one deep below the waves. For all the issues with its surface fleet, Russia's current fleet of 58 submarines have been long considered among the most powerful in the world. This includes 11 nuclear-powered ballistic missile subs, 17 nuclear-powered attack subs, and 9 nuclear-powered cruise missile subs, with several more on the way next year. While they haven't been a factor in Ukraine, they are still considered a critical threat by the US military. However, their power may not last forever. Recent reports suggest that Russia's submarine capabilities are being seriously harmed by the backlash to its invasion, especially through the crippling effect of Western sanctions. So what does that mean for the future of the Russian military? And just how serious of a blow could it be to Putin's war machine? To understand just how critical Putin's submarine problem could be, we first need to take a quick look at some Russian naval history, which, funnily enough, is permeated with continuing and humiliating losses of fleets. But wait, there's a plot twist, and it occurs just after World War II. Russia has had military power at sea in one form or another since 1696, when Peter the Great first established the Imperial Russian Navy. Impressed by his visits to Western Europe, Peter realized that Russia could never be a true great power while remaining landlocked. By 1710, he had over 58 ships in his fleet, and despite some defeats, by Peter's death in 1725, Russia was the dominant sea power in the Baltic. During the reign of Catherine the Great, the empire's ambitions at sea had grown, establishing a new Black Sea fleet and annexing Crimea for the first time in 1783. By the time of her death in 1796, Russia possessed the world's largest navy after Britain. This period was the height of Russia's imperial naval power. As naval historian Robert A. Theobald once put it, to my mind, the death of Catherine marks the high watermark in Russian naval history. From this date to the end of the Imperial Navy, it was on a treadmill working hard, but getting nowhere. This became obvious during the Crimean War of 1853 to 1856, where Russia suffered a stinging defeat to the combined forces of the Ottomans, France, and Britain. The shortcomings of the Imperial Navy were even more obvious by the time of the 1904-1905 Russo-Japanese War. But it gets worse. In response to Russian expansionism in the Far East, the newly industrialized Japanese military gave Russian Tsar Nicholas II a humiliating defeat at sea. The war marked Japan's emergence as a great power and contributed heavily to the first Russian Revolution of 1905. Following the Second Revolution in 1917, what remained of the old Imperial Navy came under control of the Soviet Union. 
and while Lenin and Stalin both aimed to rebuild a powerful Soviet navy, it remained largely inept throughout both world wars and into the early 1950s. As Theobald described it in his well-known 1953 presentation at the US Naval War College, this is the history of a navy which has lost more complete fleets than any other navy in the world. It is the history of a navy which has never been more than second-rate, that has never been decisive in world history, and that has never developed a depth of tradition to compare with those of the Western navies. But this would change drastically only a few years after his assessment, mainly due to one factor – modern submarines. While Russia had some early submarines before World War II, the first modern Soviet ballistic missile submarines were completed in the late 1950s. These early Soviet models were diesel-electric and based on designs pioneered by the Germans, similar to the United States. However, by 1960, the Soviet Navy had launched its first nuclear-powered attack submarines, giving the USSR below-surface capabilities greater than perhaps any country except the US. Soon after, the Soviets also developed nuclear SSGN-class subs, running on nuclear power but designed to launch limited ballistic missile strikes against American aircraft carriers and other naval deployments. Over the next three decades, the Soviet Navy continued to build and maintain a large fleet of submarines, relying on them heavily to challenge America's greater military strength during the Cold War. Because the true names of Soviet subs were rarely known abroad, most are still referred to by NATO codenames, such as the Alpha-class nuclear subs. These use liquid metal-cooled reactor propulsion systems and titanium hulls, enabling them to move extremely fast, over 43 knots, or 80 kilometers an hour, at an operational depth of 2,000 feet, or 600 meters. Also important to Soviet deterrence and power projection were the Typhoon-class subs. The largest submarines ever built, Typhoons are over 563 feet, or 172 meters long, have a beam of 81 feet, or 25 meters, and can carry up to 20 sturgeon nuclear-capable ballistic missiles. These were just a few of the many varieties of subs developed by the Soviet Navy, and the Soviets also continued heavily building diesel-electric models as well, such as the Kilo-class attack subs and others. The fleet was never able to make the switch to fully nuclear-powered, largely due to budgetary and technological constraints. However, by its peak in 1980, the USSR's submarine force had 480 boats, including 71 fast attack and 94 cruise and ballistic missile submarines. Even following the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, this submarine fleet remained a major part of Russia's naval power. Dmitry Gorenberg of the Center for Naval Analyses has noted that during the post-Cold War period, Putin has focused on developing new submarine capabilities, while Russia has essentially lost the ability to construct new, advanced surface vessels. The most advanced of these submarine developments are the Yasin and updated Yasin M-class SSGNs. Developed in the 1990s and early 2000s, Rand Corporation researcher Edward Geist has described these as the crown jewel of the contemporary Russian Navy and perhaps the pinnacle of present-day Russian military technology. And according to Admiral Foggo, one major advantage of the Yasin class vessels is that they are very quiet, which is the most important thing in submarine warfare. They can also carry both Sircon hypersonic and long range caliber cruise missiles. Yet these deadly subs also come with a hefty price tag. The Severa Davinsk, the first Yasin class model, reportedly cost over $1.6 billion. While this is still much cheaper than the US's most advanced subs, it is a very high price tag considering Russia's far smaller economy. In the past few years, Putin's government has also claimed that even more nuclear subs are in the works, including what Russian state media claim to be a new division of submarines carrying nuclear-capable super torpedoes in the coming years. Nick Childs, senior fellow for naval forces and maritime security at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, has argued that investments in submarines up to this point are one of the only things which has allowed Russia to maintain its status among the leading powers. While its fleet is still far smaller than during the Soviet era, Childs points out that it remains very capable and along with some of the older submarines would still pose a threat to NATO, both at sea and against land-based targets. But even before the war in Ukraine, there were some doubts about the true effectiveness of Russia's impressive-seeming subs. While they are doubtless in better shape than its surface fleet, they have never been truly tested in combat. 
So how are Putin's submarine fleets faring in the Russo-Ukraine conflict? On land, the reckless nature of Russian military doctrine has been on full display in the invasion of Ukraine. But despite the enormous losses by Russia's ground forces, its navy has so far played a very limited role in the conflict. This includes its submarines, which have remained mostly as a nuclear deterrent and threat. The exception to this is Russia's Black Sea Fleet, where submarines off the coast of Sevastopol and Novorossiysk have been used to fire caliber missiles into Ukraine. None of these subs have so far been damaged or destroyed, and there are still concerns that they could be used to counter NATO activity and control trade routes in the Black Sea. But the consequences of Putin's invasion have created a different kind of problem for the Russian Navy and its submarines. The crushing regime of Western sanctions imposed on Russia has begun to erode the country's ability to resupply and maintain its military industry. And in December of 2022, the US State Department added even more sanctions directly targeting Russia's naval power. These have already begun to work, cutting Russia off from the technology required in modern subs. As Admiral Foggo told Newsweek in an interview, I think they have been severely crippled by these economic sanctions and by their own foolishness in the war in Ukraine. In particular, the maintenance of existing subs and development of new ones will become increasingly difficult since, when they don't have the raw materials, they can't sustain the industrial base, they don't have the manpower because that manpower is going into fighting the war in Ukraine. Military losses and brain drain make it likely that Russia will lose its ability to compete with Western countries in submarine development, especially when it comes to their ability to project power. Graham P. Hurd of the George C. Marshall European Center for Security Studies argues that the protracted nature of the conflict and the coming Ukrainian counteroffensive undercuts Russian military credibility. The repeated military failures in Ukraine have created growing pressure in Russia to project an image of strength through its submarines. In turn, this has incentivized the Russian Navy to take greater risks by using submarines which are not seaworthy and fast-tracking new weapon systems without proper testing. Heard added that submarines are the most expensive ticket item in Russia's military budget and have no obvious utility in this war so Russia compensates and projects power through acceptance of greater risk. As a consequence, Russia's submarines will suffer indirect and long-term damage the longer the war lasts. Similarly, Heard and other experts have pointed out that the sanctions illustrate just how much of Russia's military-industrial complex was, and remains, reliant on critical Western technology. Without the advanced components for submarines manufactured in the US, UK, France, Germany and elsewhere, Russian development will be seriously stunted in the years to come. And there are almost no alternatives to the technology which sanctions have cut Russia off from. Parts from China and Iran, for example, are not advanced enough to meet Moscow's requirements. While experts remain divided on just how dependent Russia's nuclear submarines are on Western tech, it's pretty clear that at least some of the imported components are necessary to build new vessels. These are mostly thought to be technologically advanced electronic components for guidance, communication and missile deployment. Russian defense journalist Alexander Timokhin wrote in January that the sanctions imposed on Russia after the special military operation left a sharp imprint on the country's technological capabilities. The production of radar complexes, communication systems, guided missiles, sonar equipment and other similar systems has proved to be difficult. As a consequence, these restrictions could make it nearly impossible to build Yasin and Yasin M-class subs and other highly capable boats. Childs from the International Institute for Strategic Studies points out that this trajectory is already visible, as while the newest Russian submarines are very capable, Russia's inefficient shipbuilding industry has struggled to deliver them on time and in significant numbers. Like other experts, he agrees that Russia's construction shortfalls will accelerate in the coming months and years since this could well be exacerbated by the increased demands on other sectors of the defense industry as a result of the war, as well as from the impact of sanctions on certain key components. So what do these deficiencies mean for Putin's ambitions and the future of the Russian military? Well, experts have outlined two main possible scenarios for the future of Russia's submarine fleet. One possibility is that as military resource constraints continue to grow, it will lead to prioritization of the elements which have been most impacted especially ground forces. As of May 2023, 
Russia has lost nearly 200,000 soldiers, a truly staggering figure for a modern military. In turn, as one analyst put it, that will inevitably lead to cuts, or limits at least, in shipbuilding in the future. The other possibility is that Russia will be forced to funnel more investment into submarines due to their relative importance and strategic value. This will mean less and less resources for replenishing ground troops and equipment, which are both cheaper and more expendable. But even if Putin opts for the second scenario, any money spent now is likely to have a delayed impact. Past investments in submarine development and maintenance will carry the Russian fleet for at least a few more years to come, but within five to ten years, it could be a very different picture. Just based on the size and current capabilities of Russian submarines, it will likely remain one of the world's most powerful fleets for the next decade. But after that, things are far more uncertain. Any modern submarine which breaks down in the years could become essentially useless, reduced to just so much expensive scrap metal. However Putin attempts to manage his growing economic constraints, the main role of Russian submarines will probably remain as a nuclear deterrent. And there are also some indications that Putin has already realized just how spread thin his resources really are. In March, Russia's Pacific fleet underwent a series of military drills which were described as a surprise inspection of more than a dozen submarines, potentially signaling a lack of faith by the Kremlin in the readiness or maintenance of the fleet. Readouts from the Kremlin show that Putin recently told Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu that while Russia's priorities remain the war in Ukraine, still, the objective to develop the Navy, including in the Pacific theater of operations, remains relevant. Adding that, it is clear that some of the fleet's assets can be used in conflicts elsewhere. This indicates both that Putin does not believe submarines can make much of a difference in Ukraine, and that they remain most useful as a nuclear deterrent. As Russia's submarines begin to break down in the coming years, with no easy way to maintain them or build new state-of-the-art models, the country will also become less able to project power in this way. This will almost certainly happen, regardless of where the Kremlin prioritizes resources, especially since casualties in Ukraine show no sign of slowing down. As losses climb higher and higher, and as sanctions continue their squeeze, it may also provoke Putin into even more aggressive and reckless strategies. In fact, there is evidence that this is already taking place. In the past few months, Russia has deployed submarines in increasingly threatening positions. As Michael Peterson, the director of the Russia Maritime Studies Institute, told Newsweek, we have indications that nuclear-powered submarines have been deploying off the coast of the United States and into the Mediterranean and elsewhere along Europe periphery, in ways that mirror Soviet-style submarine deployments in the Cold War. Such aggressive posturing is likely tied to Putin's growing issues in an attempt to project a facade of Russia as a true global power, despite an economy less than half the size of California. This weakness is also reflected in overly optimistic predictions for its military-industrial complex. A recent analysis by the Institute for the Study of War ISW, concluded, similarly to other experts, that Russian officials continue to claim that Russian defense manufacturers are increasing production amidst ongoing indications that the Russian Defense Industrial Base DIB, is unable to meet Russia's long-term economic and military goals. There have been rosy claims by officials like Alexei Rachmanov, head of the Russian United Shipbuilding Company, that submarine production time will soon be cut by 8 to 13 months. But there is little evidence to support this. And in another sign of growing weakness, Putin signed a decree on February the 27th, reducing previous plans to construct at least three nuclear reactor-equipped LIDAR-class icebreakers by 2035 down to just a single vessel. Again, this likely reflects the fact that the need to replenish the stocks of conventional ground weaponry lost in Ukraine will likely consume the majority of Russia's DIB and limit Russia's ability to produce systems aimed at longer-term strategic goals. This includes both nuclear icebreakers and submarines, indicating that Russia's resources are spread much thinner than Putin would like the world to believe. So, to sum up, despite the claims by the Kremlin, there are strong signs that Russia's disastrous strategy in Ukraine has backfired even more than we know. The squeeze of Western sanctions now threatens to render even the deadly Russian submarine fleet obsolete. The longer the war goes on and the more isolated Russia becomes, the harder it will be to obtain the advanced components needed for these vessels. This will continue to erode the country's industrial base, possibly crippling all long-term defense production. And because Russian losses in Ukraine are so heavy, 
Putin also faces a crisis of credibility and growing pressure to project a facade of power. This has already led to reckless, aggressive posturing by Russian subs and a willingness to use vessels which are not even seaworthy, a problem which seems likely to increase. Because the Russian Navy has historically been so reliant on them to project power, there is little question that the stagnation of its submarine fleet will be a serious blow in the coming years. But what do you think? Will sanctions and battlefield losses eventually doom Russia's submarine fleet? Or can Putin find a way around these issues and keep Russia as a great power? Let us know what you think in the comments section below. And don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis. Poor training is killing Russian pilots, and it's not looking good for Putin's ambitions in Ukraine. Despite having over 700 aircraft, including as many as 400 modern multi-role fighter jets and fighter bomber planes to its name, the Russian Aerospace Forces, or VKS, has experienced dramatic losses over the Ukrainian skies. Estimates vary, though some suggest that the VKS has lost around 130 planes and the pilots flying them since the beginning of the war. Why have these losses been so severe? Though equipment issues have certainly played a role, the far bigger issue for Russia right now is the apparent lack of training many of its pilots received prior to taking to the skies during the conflict. And that inferior training, which is already leading to many more than Russia anticipated, not only suggests we'll see more of the country's pilots lose their lives in the current conflict, but may lead to the complete breakdown of the VKS as a powerful force in the future. This is not what Putin expected. When the conflict between Russia and Ukraine began, many assumed that Russia would have the advantage on almost all fronts. A historically great, if somewhat slow-moving, military nation, the country was believed to have a stockpile of weaponry that would allow it to overwhelm Ukrainian forces that would likely have to rely on guerrilla tactics while fighting on home soil, and as mentioned, the country has a huge stockpile of aircraft ready to fly. Along with the 400 modern fighters discussed earlier, it was believed the VKS has over 300 legacy planes that have been converted to handle modern combat capabilities, MiG-31BM and MiG-29 SMTs among them, to create an impressive air force that would wreak havoc on Ukrainian defenses. In fact, the prevailing opinion was that Russia's VKS was so well trained that its pilots could effectively use this blend between modern and repurposed planes as part of COMEOs, composite air operations that could involve up to 100 aircraft. Many believe, despite some of the country's aircraft starting to show their age, the modern fighter jets it has, which include the Su-34 and Su-35, would make up for any airborne deficiencies that could occur. That hasn't happened. And looking at Russia's recent history in wartime situations, the reasons why become clearer. Take its 2015 intervention in the Syrian civil war as an example. Rather than using composite air operations or COMEOs, most of Russia's sorties in this conflict focused on sending single aircraft or paired fighters to either patrol the skies or drop weapons, unguided, to ground troops. Though perhaps escaping attention at the time, this lack of Comeo use hinted at a larger problem in the VKS that we've only seen come to fruition about half a decade later. The VKS may not have flown Comeos because their pilots were simply incapable of the job. The question is simple, why? Why did the VKS actively avoid employing Comeo tactics in Syria, despite Comeos being much more effective than single and paired pilot runs? And why hasn't the VKS improved its approach during the Ukrainian conflict? It appears the answer may come down to a combination of a variety of factors. Let's start with inferior equipment. There's an old saying that a good worker never blames their tools for failing to get the job done. However, that saying doesn't apply in the world of air combat, where even the slightest issue with equipment can make the difference between life and death. In Russia's case, the tools they're providing to their pilots don't appear to be fit for purpose when it comes to succeeding in an extended conflict, such as the one the war in Ukraine has become. Take the supposedly modernized MiG fighters that make up a large proportion of the country's air fleet as an example. According to the RAND Corporation, these Soviet-era aircraft, which have been in operation since the 1980s, were built to handle up to 3,500 hours of flight. And though many of the craft have been upgraded to extend this maximum output, the fact remains that much of Moscow's fleet, particularly its MiGs and the earlier SU models, are reaching the end of their service lives. In fact, RAND estimates that Russia may have lost up to 57 of its aircraft due to the extra hours asked of them beyond their capabilities, with some being shot down due to a combination of reasons, pilot inadequacy and the craft itself no longer being viable in combat. 
Now let's switch our attention to the more modern fighters in the Russian fleet. The Su-35 is the jewel in the Moscow crown, but when it's stacked up against other modern fighters, particularly the American F-22 Raptor stealth jet, it gets left in the dust every time. Take the Su-35's radar cross-section, for instance. Business Insider reported back in 2016 that the Su-35's radar cross-section landed somewhere between 3 and 10 feet, easily detectable by most advanced radar hardware. By comparison, the F-22s came back at the size of a marble. Having a more detectable plane creates a challenge for even the most skilled of pilots, but for the poorly trained flyers in the VKS it's practically a death sentence. There are other issues. For instance, the Su-35 is also one of the few modern fighter jets not to have an active electronically scanned array ASA, radar, instead using the older passive electronically scanned array PACER radars. Those PACER radars are more prone to jamming and malfunctions and aren't as capable as ACES of detecting smaller targets, especially those on the ground. And so, we see the modern Russian pilot's first problem. They're flying and being trained on outdated military hardware that isn't fit for purpose when stacked against modern options. But this brings us to an interesting point. Ukraine hardly has the most advanced fleet either, with much of its meager air force using similar updated Soviet-era machines as the Russians, and yet far more Russian pilots are getting shot down or crashing compared to Ukrainian pilots. There must be more going on behind the scenes, and if you look a little closer, it becomes a lot easier to see the evidence of poor training that may be at the heart of Russia's recent flight failures. In 2022, Harry Bonham, an aerospace analyst at the analytics company Global Data, offered some insight into what the VKS's pilot training methodology looks like. He said that training outlines provided by the VKS indicated that a graduating pilot from the Russian Air Force's academy had to complete over 100 hours of flight time as recently as 2017, with that number only increasing to over 120 hours in recent years. By comparison, he points out that the average Western pilot will notch between 180 and 240 flight hours under their belt before they head out into the field, up to double the flight time amassed by a supposedly qualified Russian equivalent. Perhaps we see a link between Russian training methods and the deteriorating state of its air fleet here. Remember that Rand points out a large portion of the VKS's fleet is outdated to the point where some of its planes are hitting the end of their lives as the conflict goes on, reducing Russian air strength in the process. Could the lack of training hours Russian pilots undergo, at least in comparison to their Western equivalents, be blamed on the VKS essentially rationing out the flight hours the older equipment in its fleet still has available? That's speculative, but it would at least partially explain why Russian pilots are handicapped by having fewer flight hours than pilots from other nations. But what's more important is the effect that this lack of flight hours has on pilots during active operations. Bonham points out that Russian authorities are likely aware of the issues this inexperience causes, which has undermined their confidence in their ability to pull off joint operations, particularly with the SAM units their troops have on the ground. We also see a lack of confidence in Russia's failure to leverage Comeo tactics, as discussed earlier, and that, combined with logistical issues, appears to hamper Russia's ability to not only secure Ukrainian airspace, but to do so without suffering casualties. Inexperience may also come into play when it comes to Russia's scarce use of precision-guided munitions PGMs. It's known that the VKS has access to PGMs, which can be guided to their targets using a combination of lasers and the Russian equivalent of GPS, GLONASS, and yet we've seen fairly few of these types of munitions utilized in the Ukraine conflict. We can speculate in several directions when it comes to why, with one of the more popular opinions being that Russia has failed to stockpile enough PGMs for an extended conflict, hence their need to ration the munitions. But what seems equally likely is that many of the country's pilots simply don't know how to deploy PGMs effectively. Again, the lack of training hours comes into play here, taking away a form of attack that would aid in pilot safety. How? Rather than using PGMs, the VKS has generally used dumb bombs to attack Ukrainian targets. These unguided munitions can only hit targets once the pilot achieves visual confirmation of the target's existence, which forces the pilot to fly low and steady, making them a sitting duck for anti-air attacks. And that mention of flying low brings us to another issue with Russian pilot training. Many of its pilots seem to struggle to fly low safely. An April 2023 report by the Royal United Services Institute, a think tank based in the UK, highlighted that Russia's pilots either seem to be unwilling or incapable of providing close air support to troops on the ground. 
Providing that support would require pilots to know how to fly safely at low altitudes, which the report says is something that many, if not most, Russian pilots simply haven't been trained to do. The report goes on to state that flying at low altitudes, especially in contested situations, isn't part of the core training that Russian pilots go through in order to earn their wings. The only ones that can are typically members of the Su-25SM Frogfoot fleet, a small part of the VKS's fleet. That lack of low-altitude training bore its most terrible fruits, at least from a Russian perspective, during the first week of March 2022. The country lost 10 of its jets, alongside several helicopters in that week, all shot down by Ukrainian forces, and most flying below 3,000 feet in daylight conditions. Those crafts became instantly vulnerable to Ukrainian manpads, shoulder-fired missiles deployed by ground-based troops, and it's not speculative to say that the VKS quickly decided that having its pilots flying low to the ground, especially in daylight hours, simply wasn't an option anymore. After that first week of March 2022, the VKS quickly switched from using fixed-wing and rotary craft on the front lines to bombarding Ukrainian troops with unguided rockets and minimal PGM attacks. Speaking of Russian aircraft shot down during the early stages of the war, Another issue was discovered that perfectly demonstrates how the combination of poor training and inadequate equipment leads to the deaths of so many VKS pilots. In a speech at the National Army Museum in May 2022, the then Defense Secretary of the United Kingdom, Ben Wallace, noted that several downed VKS jets had been found with insecure navigational equipment. As Wallace, a graduate of Sandhurst's Royal Military Academy, put it, the equipment essentially seemed to be GPS receivers that were taped to the dashboards of the jets. These findings raise more questions. Does the VKS have so little faith in the Russian GLONASS system that it's willing to place its pilots at risk by supplying them with insecure and unencrypted GPS receivers that make them easier to detect? Or has the lack of training these pilots have received led them to independently trying to use these GPS systems because they're unaware of the risks that come with navigating using unsecured equipment. Either possibility is disturbing, but both could have played a hand in why Russia lost so many of its pilots during the early stages of the Ukraine conflict. Even so, Russia is a large country with a population of nearly 145 million people. Even with the loss of so many pilots due to poor training and inadequate equipment, surely it can train more to replace those losses and even with so many of its jets being shot down, it still easily has the aerial might to subdue Ukraine, right? Unfortunately for Russia, it's not that simple. A May 2022 story published in the Moscow Times reported that Major General Kanamat Batashev was shot down from the skies over Ukraine while piloting a Su-25 fighter jet. While that story may seem unremarkable in the context of the dramatic losses Russia has already experienced, it becomes more interesting when you learn that Botashev was a 63-year-old retired pilot. What's more, he'd essentially been forced into retirement from active duty in 2012 after he'd crashed at Su-27 while demonstrating acrobatic maneuvers, which raises an obvious question. What was a retired and high-ranking member of the Russian military doing flying on the front lines of the conflict? The answer likely comes back to the lack of training the country's other pilots have. Perhaps the VKS wasn't confident in the skills of its younger flyers, forcing them into bringing older pilots who are perhaps not up to speed on modern flying into the fold. Botashev's death shows that it may not have been a good tactic. Still, it also presents another problem for Russia, as his death, along with the deaths of other senior members, could have a knock-on effect on the quality of future pilots in the VKS. In fact, this is something that Yuri Inat, the spokesman for the Ukrainian Air Force, all but said in comments published in Ukrainska Pravda, an online Ukrainian news website. He points out that the VKS is continuing to train pilots in its academy and likely has the ability to create between 100 and 150 new pilots annually. So there's little danger of the VKS running out of flyers. But Inart points out that the quality of those pilots will be lower in comparison to those who've already been shot down, as many of the pilots so far were veterans of the Syrian conflict mentioned earlier. So, the future clearly presents a problem for the VKS on two fronts. First, it appears to rely on sheer numbers to overwhelm Ukrainian defenses. This has already been demonstrated not to work and will only become a less viable tactic as more inexperienced pilots enter the conflict. Second, losing so many of its veterans to the war means that the pilots the VKS train in the future will lose valuable sources of knowledge, both in the academy and when they're in the field compounding their inexperience to the point where it becomes dangerous. And worse yet for Putin, 
It's not just Ukrainians shooting down his most experienced flyers that he has to worry about, it's his own people. In June 2023, Putin confirmed that the Wagner militia mutineers managed to down 13 VKS pilots during their short-lived insurrection. That's 13 on top of the 130 or so that Ukraine has managed to shoot down, and it's likely that at least some of those pilots were experienced veterans. The picture painted here is grim. If the VKS's pilots can't even handle a militia mutiny, one that lasted only a day, what chance do they have when trying to take on Ukrainian troops on less familiar soil? Ironically, fighting from within has done as much to expose the poor training of the VKS pilots as the war in Ukraine has. Through all of this, it's important not to discount the fact that Ukraine has done an excellent job of exploiting the weaknesses inherent in the VKS approach. For instance, Forbes reports that the VKS training doctrine essentially classes its air force as an extension of its army. That approach, which again is mirrored in the training that the VKS pilots receive, leads to Russia approaching air combat as a way to briefly control small portions of airspace so its craft can come in, drop bombs, and leave. That runs counter to the Kameo approach taken by the US Air Force, which focuses on coordinated efforts to control large amounts of airspace and, as we've already seen, plays right into Ukraine's hands. VKS pilots are trained to come in and deploy munitions, but at the same time, that tactic requires an understanding of low-altitude flight, which we've already established is an understanding many VKS pilots don't have. Ukraine has taken advantage of this lack of training in the very approach that Russia favors to down dozens of fixed-wing fighters using manpads backed by long-range defense systems, such as Tunguska and Tor. It's smart work by the Ukrainians. Knowing how Russia was likely to use its air fleet to attack, it essentially forced dozens of inexperienced pilots flying at low altitudes directly into a path of its anti-air defenses, and due, at least in part, to their lack of training, many of these pilots did not know how to avoid ground-based defenses that are hardly innovative in the theater of war. When you combine this knowledge of VKS tactics with the consistent stream of information and equipment Ukraine is receiving from its Western allies, the situation continues to look dire for a Russian air force that is already depleted and likely only to be restocked with more poorly trained pilots. Finally, consider this. In August 2023, the United States approved the delivery of F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine. While far from the newest jets the US has to offer, F-16s have poorer radar and less capable missiles than Russia's Su-35, it's entirely possible that better training delivered to Ukraine's pilots could lead them to understanding their crafts better than Russian pilots understand the ones they're flying. So it may not be long before we see reports of Ukrainian pilots actively downing Russian ones in dogfights, assuming Russia is brave enough to send its pilots to fight Ukraines directly, given the losses the VKS has experienced so far. But what do you think? How large a role has the poor training offered to Russia's pilots played in the losses the VKS has suffered during the conflict? Is Russia even capable of creating a new crop of pilots that won't fall victim to the combination of outdated equipment, ineffective training, and superior Ukrainian tactics in the future? Tell us your opinions in the comment section below. Before the invasion of Ukraine, Russia prided itself on its tank force, and many international military experts bought into the Kremlin's hype. Russia had the world's largest tank fleet, at over 12,500 units, and Western experts feared that its newest tank, the T-14 Armada, would prove superior to any of the tanks in NATO's arsenal. Another of the Russian armored vehicles that Western experts feared before the invasion was the scary-sounding BMPT Terminator. This vehicle was fast, well-armored, and armed to the teeth, and yet when it was deployed to the battlefields of Ukraine, it proved to be of little consequence, unable to change the tempo of the war. While effective, the BMPT Terminator proved far from the terror that the Kremlin said it was. Let's take a look at the history of the BMPT Terminator and how it did not exactly perform as Russia's military bloggers and Putin's regime advertised when it actually went to war. The BMPT Terminator saw its origins in the Chechen Wars of the 1990s. In these urban conflicts, Chechen fighters armed with light anti-tank weapons like RPGs took a terrible toll on Russian armored forces, as troops bearing these arms fired down from rooftops and high-story perches on the thinly protected tops of Russian tanks, destroying them in large numbers. To make matters worse for the Russian armor, it could not retaliate because the turrets on Russia's tanks and armored vehicles, like the BMP, cannot raise their main guns at high angles. They can't lower their guns to low angles either, and Chechen fighters would ambush them from basements too. 
In response to the poor performance of its armored forces against the Chechens, the Russians designed a new armored vehicle, the BMPT Terminator. While these vehicles are designed to support main battle tanks in urban warfare, they come armed with twin 30mm autocannons capable of firing multiple types of rounds, ranging from hardened armor-piercing rounds to explosive shells. Both autocannons come with a capacity of 850 rounds. To make the Terminator more versatile, it can load different rounds in each of its autocannons, so one gun can fire anti-personnel rounds and another can shoot armor-piercing shells. The autocannons have a range between 2.5 and 4 kilometers depending on the round. The targeting system was originally designed to give gunners the ability to designate one target for one round and another for a different round if need be, but this was found to be confusing and impractical and subsequently discontinued by the Russian brass. It is possible that this capability could be restored with advances in artificial intelligence, but given that this is Russia we're talking about, it's probably best not to bet on that possibility coming to fruition anytime soon. BMPT Terminator tanks can also carry a set of four Attacka T 130mm guided missiles, two in pods on either side of the vehicle's autocannons. These missiles are versatile and can be used in an anti armor role, a high explosive building clearing role, or even to attack some helicopters. Thermobaric versions can also be deployed. The Attacka missiles can hit targets up to six kilometers away. As a tertiary weapon, the BMPT Terminator has a 7.62mm PTKM machine gun with a capacity of 2,100 rounds. One version of the Terminator also comes armed with four AG-17D 30mm grenade launchers with a capacity of up to 600 rounds, which it can fire at a rate of 480 rounds per minute. These grenades have a kill radius of 7 meters and a range of 1.7 kilometers. The vehicle has a crew of five men. And there's another version of the Terminator, which lacks the grenade launchers and comes with a crew of three. The BMPT Terminator has separate sights for the commander and gunner, giving it redundancy if one of the sights malfunctions. Laser range finders and computerized fire control systems support these sights. These systems are designed to operate in conjunction with the vehicle's high speed of 60 km per hour while it's cruising. Defensively, the BMPT Terminator is shielded by explosive reactive armor. This is armor that disrupts anti-tank weapons by exploding outwards when a projectile makes contact with it, preventing the worst from happening to the vehicle. The Terminator has metal grills on its sides and back also, which can reduce the penetration power of some anti-armor weapons. The vehicle also has six smoke grenades on each side of the turret and a screening system that warns the crew if their vehicle is being subjected to laser tracking. The Terminator's crew can raise the vehicle's gun turret to 45 degrees, allowing them to fire at threats from above. The turret can also move downward to negative 5 degrees, making the vehicle effective at attacking targets from below or directly in front of it. The turret can also spin 360 degrees. This maneuverability makes the BMPT Terminator far less vulnerable than other Russian tanks and armored vehicles. This one can actually retaliate if troops fire on it from rooftops. The vehicle weighs about 53 tons and has a cruising range of 500 kilometers. Its engine is nearly 1,000 horsepower, and it's maneuverable. The Terminator can traverse ditches between 2.6 and 2.8 meters wide. It can also dive into 1.2 meters of water, which can increase to 1.8 meters if it uses a snorkel. The BMPT Terminator is manufactured by Ural Wagenzavar, the company based in Nizhny Tagil and Sverdlovsk Oblast, which manufactures many of Russia's other tanks and armored vehicles. Future plans for the BMPT Terminator include the possibility of it becoming fully robotic. The Terminator's existence reflects Russian doctrine about warfare. Western countries learned from urban fighting in Iraq about just how important it is to integrate infantry and armored units effectively. In these counterinsurgency operations, infantry would dismount and clear buildings, infantry and armored units would support one another closely in this process. It was a combined arms approach to city fighting. Russian doctrine, however, is all about tanks and artillery, so it designed an armored vehicle that would answer the problems that it faced in urban combat in Chechnya. According to Russian doctrine, each main battle tank in an urban setting should be protected by two Terminators, while in open terrain it's the opposite, each Terminator should be protected by two tanks. Unfortunately for the Kremlin, since Russia only has a few Terminators in active service, and it is questionable if it'll be able to manufacture any more thanks to Western sanctions, this doctrine has proven not quite applicable in Ukraine. Russia doesn't seem sure about how to use its new Terminator tanks, 
and this uncertainty has played out on the battlefield. But more on that in a moment. Despite all the hype, the program had a rocky start in Russia, and Kazakhstan was the first operator of the BMPT Terminator. The latter ordered 10 of the vehicles in 2010 and saw them delivered between 2011 and 2013. Algeria was the second operator, ordering 300 in April 2016, but only 13 wound up being delivered. Azerbaijan and Peru expressed interest in the Terminator tank, but none were ever delivered to those countries. The BMPT Terminator finally found service in its homeland in the late 2010s. In 2017, the Russian ground forces signed a contract agreeing to use the BMPT Terminator. The vehicles were delivered and entered service in the Russian military the following year. The BMPT and its variants are built on the chassis of a T-72 or a T-90 tank. The Russian brass has talked about building a Terminator 3 unit on the chassis of the T-14 Armada. However, given that only about 20 Armada tanks have ever been built, the Terminator 3 is unlikely to come to fruition anytime soon. The BMPT Terminator, like so much of Russia's supposedly most advanced warfighting assets, was initially absent in the invasion of Ukraine. The reasons for this are not known, but given that Putin believed his military's own hype and expected the regime in Kyiv to fall in days, he might have believed that it was not necessary to risk one of Russia's best weapon systems, one which had already seen some sales abroad. When Kyiv did not fall and the Russian military found itself in a long war of attrition, things began to change. The first Terminator units were spotted in Ukraine in May 2022 in the Battle of Severodonetsk, three months after the invasion. The deployment of this unit was mostly psychological, although the BMPT Terminator's combat debut came at a moment when Russia was proving most effective in the war, there were far too few of these vehicles to meaningfully affect the outcome of military operations. Indeed, footage swirled of the BMPT Terminator needing to retreat from its first combat engagement. That would be far from the end of its story in Ukraine, however. The relatively few Terminator armored vehicles have performed better than Russia's main battle tank fleet which has taken terrible casualties in the face of Ukrainian resistance. Some Russian military bloggers have even implored the Kremlin to replace the outdated T-72 tank with Terminator units. In stark contrast to Russia's traditional tanks, which have often been blown sky-high thanks to their ammunition storage design, the BMPT Terminator has taken few casualties. The BMPT Terminator does not have the same design flaw as Russia's main battle tanks, giving it increased survivability which may be one of the reasons it was able to retreat to safety in May 2022. According to some of the military bloggers, the Terminator has proven formidable in urban and forested environments in Ukraine. The survivability dichotomy between the Terminator and its main battle tank comrades played out after the former's deployment in Ukraine. Although deployed only in small numbers, the first confirmed kill of a BMPT Terminator came in February 2023, nine months after the unit's initial entry into the war meaning that these units had survived until then. The BMPT Terminator's design seems well suited for modern warfare. Russia's always emphasized its tank forces, but tank-on-tank -tank combat has proven rare in Ukraine. Indirect fire, especially with the help of drones, has been the norm in Ukraine. Drones and other precision strikes make it far easier to spot tanks and shoot them indirectly over great distances, long before they ever get into range for a traditional tank duel. The death of the tank so often spoken of in military circles, has proven far from the case in Ukraine though, despite the relative lack of traditional tank combat there. Tanks remain useful for storming enemy positions, but the traditional tank gun is less suited for this purpose. After all, if tank-on-tank -tank combat is becoming rarer, tank turrets loaded with rounds to take out other tanks might not be so optimal. This is where the BMPT Terminator has seemed to shine. Footage taken of the Terminator vehicles in Ukraine seems to show them performing well in multi-purpose rapid assault roles. Video footage has also shown Terminator vehicles fighting well at night. In July 2023, Russia's Terminator tank took part in action near Avdiivka, in what may have been part of a staging operation for Russia's offensive toward that settlement later in the year. Russian sources claim that during a night engagement, a Terminator fired 400 high-explosive fragmentation and armor-piercing shells at Ukrainian targets four kilometers away. So how has Ukraine dealt with Russian Terminator vehicles, which have proven among them more effective in the conflict? Has the BMPT Terminator lived up to the hype that some of the Russian military bloggers have assigned to it? Ukraine scored its first confirmed kill of a BMPT Terminator in February 2023, 
when an artillery unit scored a direct hit on one in Kremina in Luhansk Oblast. The gunners attacked a Terminator that had been sitting idly on a forest road. The unit may have been damaged or had mechanical difficulties before then. The damage to this unit was total. The artillery shell struck the vehicle's ammunition magazine, indicated by the fireball in the blast. Ukraine has also demonstrated its ability to be more innovative in the ways it's destroyed the Terminator tanks. The next confirmed combat loss of a BMPT Terminator came in August 2023 near the town of Spartak in Donetsk Oblast. There, Ukraine once again proved its prowess in drone warfare. Ukraine Special Forces Group Alpha posted a video showing a swarm of small, grenade-bearing, first-person view drones chasing down and assaulting one of Russia's Terminator tanks. The Terminator was at least immobilized after the action and needed to be towed by a nearby T-80 main battle tank. That tank was also hit in a drone strike. This incident lacked the fireball that accompanied the Terminator destroyed in the February attack, so the unit may have been salvageable. Ukrainian forces nevertheless gloated about the incident, saying on X, formerly Twitter, this rare model of enemy weaponry burned down after only a few hits from kamikaze drones. They tried to pull out the downed Terminator with a T-80 tank, but it was also hit. FVP drones have proven to be some of Ukraine's best anti-vehicle weapons, and they are cheap costing only about $5,000 each. Their cheapness and ease of control with a virtual reality headset has made them popular on both sides of the conflict. The Terminator may have been designed to shoot at upward targets, but it was clearly not prepared to shoot at multiple fast-moving targets like FPV drones. The vehicle may not have been put permanently out of commission, but given that only perhaps 10 of them have been deployed to Ukraine, the loss of even one is a great blow to Russia. The third incident came in September 2023, on the 27th of the month. Ukrainian soldiers, this time in the mutant group, again employed FPV drones, again near Spartak, to damage or destroy a BMPT Terminator. The vehicle had used an infamous cope cage for added protection, but that was not enough to prevent the drones from going to town on it. Given the timing and vicinity of the incident, some observers wondered whether this vehicle was the same as the Terminator damaged in August, but there was no way to verify this. A BREM recovery vehicle was also damaged in the attack. Again, there was no fireball indicating that its ammunition had been torched, but the vehicle was at least temporarily out of commission, and Ukraine proved the concept of attacking Russia's Terminator tanks with drones. Repeat successful drone attacks show one of the Terminator's weaknesses and the weakness of other contemporary armored vehicles. The BMPT Terminator might be armed to the teeth, but it is not designed to hit such fast-moving small targets. The Terminator's engineers were reportedly trying to improve the vehicle's air defense systems as early as 2018, but these improvements were meant to be against helicopters, especially ones capable of firing missiles from distances of up to 5 kilometers. Drone defenses were not mentioned. The Terminator tank comes with other weaknesses too. The vehicle might have a lot in the way of offense, but defensively it is lacking. In contrast to the turret of a main battle tank, a Terminator's turret is much more lightly armored. The vehicle's missiles are armored to protect against explosive fragments and shrapnel, but that's about it. The hull might protect the crew, but the top of the vehicle is vulnerable. Concentrated small arms fire on the turret of a Terminator tank would be sufficient to imperil its weapons. The design is particularly vulnerable to something like a javelin, which attacks its target on a downward trajectory to avoid the most heavily armored features of the tank, or in this case, the BMPT Terminator. Another problem that the Terminator tank has is it lacks the situational awareness that a combined arms approach to warfare would have, no matter how advanced its sensors are. The United States learned through experience in Iraq that armored vehicles cannot replace the situational awareness and rapid response time of infantry support. It's a lesson that Russia clearly has not learned in Ukraine. Although Soviet gear and doctrine still permeates much of the Ukrainian military, it is rapidly absorbing the lessons in doctrine and training afforded by its Western allies, and Ukraine has had much better success in integrating infantry and other arms with its armor than its Russian opponents have. The two Ukrainian drone attacks against Terminator tanks serve as a good example. Russia's overall failure of giving its Terminator and other armored vehicles adequate infantry support is one of the reasons why it has lost so many of them in the conflict. The Terminator tank escaped to this fate for a time, but two incidents in two months demonstrate that Ukraine is adapting to the presence of this vehicle. 
Interestingly, one of the ways that Ukraine originally sought to adapt to the Russian Terminator tank was to build a model of its own. These vehicles are known as the Stras or Sentinel. In October 2017, a Ukrainian company called Zytomir Armored Plant unveiled an armored vehicle similar to Russia's Terminator tank. It used the chassis of a T-64 main battle tank and had a turret that also looked like the Terminators. The turret boasted twin ZTM-2 30mm autocannons, a Ukrainian adaptation of the Soviet ZA-42. Two PKT 7.62mm machine guns served as secondary weapons. The Sentinel also came packed with four anti-tank guided missile launchers, with two mounted on the side of each turret. There was also an AG-17 30mm automatic grenade launcher in the center on top of the turret. Three smoke grenade launchers were attached to the sides of the turret as well, giving the vehicle more concealability in the event that it came under attack. The Sentinel was designed for a crew of three men. The vehicle unveiled in 2017 had explosive reactive armor on its front and sides. The driver sat in the front at the center of the hull, with the other two crew members at the front of the turret. Each crew member was to have their own hatch. The driver had a periscope, and the top of the turret was mounted with a video monitor, laser rangefinder, and electronic systems. However, despite these seemingly impressive features, Ukraine never put these vehicles into mass production and has not used them in its fight against the Russian invaders. Information on why it chose not to pursue the Sentinel is a little elusive, but it could be because of NATO training. Since Western doctrine insists on close cooperation between infantry and armor, while Russian doctrine tends to solve all problems with tanks and artillery, Ukraine might have no longer seen a need for the production of an expensive tank when it could focus on cheaper, more rapid-fire support systems for its traditional tanks, like anti-armor infantry and drones. Given the limited number of BMPT Terminator tanks that Russia's built, the vehicle's vulnerable turret, and its now demonstrated weakness to drones, it may be that Ukraine was wise to avoid what could have been a costly rabbit hole. The jury is still out on the Terminator's overall effectiveness on the modern battlefield compared to a traditional tank, but the idea promoted by some of the Russian military bloggers that this vehicle would be a major boost for Russia's struggling effort in Ukraine appears to be just that, an idea. What do you think about the BMPT Terminator tank? If it were produced in greater numbers, would it have been better luck on modern battlefields than Russia's main battle tank fleet? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Also, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more military analysis from military experts. This is Russia's next generation tank, the T-14 Armata, the latest tank from a country that has long prided itself on its armored assets. The T-14 is supposed to be armed with all the latest modern weapons, gadgets, and protective armor, in an ensemble meant to be a clear break from Soviet-era tank conventions which stretch back to World War II's revered T-34. Russia sells the T-14 as being in a league of its own, with capabilities that exceed all tanks of foreign manufacture. Indeed, the tank and the chatter around it gave Western observers the chills for a while. However, this facade is probably not all it's cracked up to be. Here's why Russia's next-generation T-14 Armata sucks when it actually comes to winning wars. Work on the project began in 2010 under the label Object 195. The first basic model of the new tank was introduced in July 2012. The Kremlin publicly unveiled this model as the T-14 Armata at a Victory Day parade in 2015, and the tank is supposed to enter full service by 2024. The Armata has, however, suffered multiple delays throughout its brief history. Thus far, only a single T-14 has been spotted in Ukraine. The sighting came in the village of Mijinskaya in Luhansk Oblast on October the 8th. The unit may have been placed there to serve as a command tank for other Russian armored assets. The Russians may also be deploying the T-14 tank as a psychological operation to increase morale on their own side after having experienced embarrassing defeats and to send a message to the Ukrainians that they have yet to best their top-line gear. But how top-line is the Armata really? Would it really make a difference in Ukraine and change Russia's ebbing fortunes if it were deployed in greater numbers? On the surface, the T-14 possesses formidable attributes. It has frontal base armor protection 
of over 900 mm in combination with Malachit Explosive Reactive Armor and the Afghani Active Protection System. If its armor system works as advertised, the T-14 should be able to take hits from any known tank munition, and with Ukraine's lack of advanced tanks, this could prove a problem should the Armata get deployed in large numbers. The T-14's armor is also supposedly resistant against handheld anti-tank weapons like the famous Javelin, which the Ukrainians have used to great effect against Russian armor in the war. The T-14 also boasts a separate, self-contained crew capsule that is isolated from its magazine and specifically designed to protect the three-man operating team from anti-tank fire, maximizing its defensiveness and aiding its ability to act as a command unit. Other shielding mechanisms include active defense systems at the front of the vehicle to shoot down common anti-tank weaponry, such as RPGs. The tank also reportedly has stealth features, with its armor having a lower radar cross-section than other tanks in use. But that's not all. The Armata is a quick and maneuverable tank, with a top speed of 75 to 80 km per hour in both forward and reverse modes. In contrast, most of Russia's widely used tanks can only achieve a top speed of 4 km per hour while in reverse, making them easy to target with anti-tank fire. The T-14 has a remote-controlled turret that loads automatically with a 45-round magazine. The standard gun is a 125mm 2A82-1M smoothbore, but it can be upgraded to a 2A83 152mm gun. Either type can also fire laser-guided missiles. The T-14's secondary weapons include the Cord 12.7mm machine gun or PKTM 7.62mm machine gun. The Armata's engagement range exceeds any Western tank, as it can hit targets up to 12 kilometers away. Sounds incredible, right? Here's the thing, though. All of these defensive and offensive features sound impressive, but Russia has proven that it isn't exactly a trustworthy source of information about its own capabilities. In reality, the T-14 has shown itself to be lacking so far, and not all is as it seems. The tank's problems stretch back to its debut, when one of them broke down and had to be towed away for repairs during a rehearsal for a military parade in Red Square in 2015, which would have been one of its first public showings. This proved only the first of many embarrassments. Often those shortcomings included not being able to pay for or manufacture the tank at scale. An impressive weapon means little if you cannot produce it in the numbers needed to shift the balance of power on the battlefield. The only one T-14 has been spotted in Ukraine after nine months of war suggests a few problems for the Russians in actually using the tank. The T-14 has been plagued by numerous delays since its public debut in 2015. The Kremlin's initial plans to field 2,300 Armata tanks proved unaffordable and Russia needed to settle for a much smaller total. The Russian armed forces expected the first batch of nine in 2018, but the Kremlin moved the date back first to 2019 and then 2020. A 2020 report in The Diplomat stated that 132 Armatas would be delivered by 2022, but that has not happened either. It turns out that the company that manufactures the tank, Oral Vagonzavod, also had its fair share of problems. The company is 87 billion rubles in debt and needed to cut the pay of its workforce by 21% between 2019 and 2020. These financial problems may be a reason why only 20 finished T-14s exist as of 2021. The Armata's frequent glitches and production delays came before the hefty sanctions the international community levied in retaliation for Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Such sanctions will make it even more difficult for Russia to obtain the materials it will need to manufacture the T-14's advanced electronics, among other systems. The T-14 may have all the high-tech features that Russia claims it has, but even if all of it was true and it all worked, it means little if the Russians cannot deploy them on the battlefield. The next-generation tank also means little if it's too expensive and becomes a white elephant, which may be the reason why Russia has been hesitant to use the T-14 in Ukraine until now. The Ukrainians have proven excellent tank killers and capturers in this war. The prospect of the T-14 falling into enemy hands must make the Kremlin take pause, and if you're too scared of losing a weapon system to deploy it, it's not exactly a useful tool. Indeed, because Russia has been unable or unwilling to produce the T-14 Armata at scale, it has instead used its resources to upgrade its older arsenal of tanks such as the T-72, T-80, and T-90A. There are other problems for the T-14 tank as well, ones which go beyond cost, manufacturing, and delivery. One of the reasons for the delays includes continual glitches in the T-14 software. These glitches came partly because of sanctions that the West imposed on Russia following its annexation of Crimea in 2014. Particularly, a major weakness inherent in the Armata is that its much-vaunted protective crew capsule cannot revolve like the gun turret can. The engineering arrangement means that the tank relies on optical systems and electronics to deliver visual information to the crew. That is not exactly ideal when you can't get your software right, and even if it were to check out, how would the crew react to their electronics being taken out during a battle?
Speaking of systems failure, some American Abrams crews who are familiar with the T-14 were not impressed with what they saw. They questioned the emphasis of its supposedly modern auto-loading cannon. When speaking in a 2018 report for Business Insider, they asked what would happen if something goes wrong in the middle of a battle and the automated loader stopped working? How much work would it take to get the breach open and get down in there? Since the self-isolated crew capsule is separate from the turret, the answer is it could take a lot of work. As the United States has seen with the F-35s and other expensive modern systems, sometimes Sometimes having the most cutting-edge technology means you sign up for a lot more things potentially going wrong, and if anything is true on a battlefield, many things will go wrong. No plan survives the first contact with the enemy. Even if the T-14's auto-loading system works perfectly, it faces another disadvantage. It is slow. Auto-loading may sound modern, but an American Abrams crew with a human loader can actually get shots off faster. They can usually fire their weapons in five-second intervals at the maximum and more often than not under four. According to Sergeant Emmett Fulgham, a tank gunner with 3rd Battalion 8th Cavalry Regiment, who talked about the subject to the military publication Coffee or Die. In contrast, the T-14's auto-loader takes 10 seconds or more to load and fire, meaning that its prospective Western opponents can get two or three shots off for every one that the Armata gets. The Armata may have a longer range, but with such limited numbers and large load times, it may simply not be able to put enough fire down range to tilt the scale of a battle, especially when there will not be many Armatas to begin with. The Armata has supposedly seen limited action in the field, and results have not been encouraging. According to the reports in Chinese media, the T-14 underperformed in its subdued use in Syria. Chinese media blasted the Russians for promoting false combat conditions under which the tank took part, claiming there was no evidence for anything that they were saying. With such praise from his friends, Vladimir Putin must be wondering what his enemies think. For their part, rebel factions in Syria commented that they had not encountered the Russians' newest tank. Other information out of Syria suggests that the Armata's vaunted system of protection didn't work so well. Reporting from 2020 indicated that soldiers wielding anti-tank weapons hit three T-14s, with one of them being completely destroyed. If such reports are true, it is feasible that the Armata's defenses do not live up to the Kremlin's hype, and that advanced anti-tank systems like the American Javelin, British Enlor, and Swedish AT-4 could destroy it, even if the crew in their isolated capsule compartment manages to survive the impact to the tank's turret and magazine. Perhaps this is the reason that only one Armata has been definitively spotted in Ukraine. Another problem that the T-14 faces is that foreign countries, even ones Russia has long had arms deals with like China, India, and Middle Eastern nations, don't seem eager to buy it. Russia has tried to sell the T-14 abroad, but it has found no buyers. The lack of foreign interest leaves Russia even more cash-strapped in developing it, since weapon R&D is expensive and foreign investments help to make the final product pay for itself. For example, robust foreign purchases of the F-35 Lightning II helped the United States share the burden in developing that infamously expensive platform. However, with the seeming lack of interest for Russia to buy one of its own assets and its design problems, other countries don't seem too keen on purchasing the Armata. China even claims that its next-generation VT-4 tank is superior to the Armata. The T-14 Armata's problems are large enough to make the Kremlin reconsider its investment in it. Another tank design, which reportedly lost out to the Armata in the 2000s called the Burlak, is now the subject of discussion in the Russian military. This tank is less revolutionary. Instead, it evolves on Russia's older tank technology to produce a vehicle nearly as good as the Armata. Whether the Burlak re-emerges and spells the doom of the T-14 project remains to be seen, but one thing is certain. The T-14 shows us that appearances can be deceiving and that most modern does not always mean most useful. But what do you think? Does the T-14 Armata have the potential to become the world's greatest tank? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Back in 2020, Putin made some big promises. By big promises, we mean one specific, armor-piercing, rapidly moving, supposedly impenetrable promise. You know what we're talking about, and it starts with a T and ends with a laser-guided missile explosion. The T-14 Armata. Putin vowed to manufacture this alleged Abrams killer, by far the strongest and most technically advanced Russian tank ever designed, in mass quantities. You can't say the guy doesn't dream big, but sometimes dreams turn into nightmares. And that's exactly what happened to the Russian dictator who is now facing an incomprehensible shortage of tanks on the battlefield in Ukraine. And we're not just talking about the T-14, which is more or less ghosting this war completely. The guy is running low on every kind of clanky, antiquated Soviet-era hardware and tanks you can think of. The Russian army is currently trying to fight off the latest and greatest Western tanks and IFVs, including American-made M1 Abrams, 
German-made Leopard 2s, and British-made Challengers, and they are failing at trying to get any real headway in these battles. Would things be different if Russia had more T-14 Armatas at its disposal? In an epic battle between the T-14 Armata and, say, the German Leopard 2, who would win? Let's lay down the stats and find out. But first, a quick review of the T-14 Armata's complicated backstory, filled with red flags that Putin clearly ignored to his own demise. In 2015, the Russian armed forces revealed the T-14 Armata, a highly secretive next-generation main battle tank based on the Armata Universal Combat Platform. The Universal Armata design was originally intended to serve as a starting point for the next generation of Russian Heavy Infantry Fighting Vehicles IFVs, and Armored Personnel Carriers AFVs. This was a common starting point among the world's strongest militaries in the 1970s and 1980s, but the Russians came to the game late, starting development on the Armata platform in 2009. The thought was that if you could build a modular next-generation tracked vehicle platform, you'd be able to slap all manner of mission-specific systems onto it according to the needs and dictates of the intended mission. Yes, you could have a powerful main battle tank, but you'd also have the basis of a fleet of combat engineering vehicles, air defense units, armored personnel carriers, tank support vehicles, and self-propelled artillery, if you wanted, ones that all run on the exact same engine, fuel, and spare parts. Ultimately, if you could pull it off, it would vastly simplify maintenance procedures and decrease production costs. But here's the problem. Mission modularity is touted as the one-stop solution to all your tactical, technological, engineering, and budgetary challenges. But in reality, universal platforms can force designers to limit a system's maximum performance by imposing artificial, fiscal, and technological constraints in the name of efficiency and integration. It's okay when the extent of the modularity is limited to, say, the seats on an aircraft, which can easily be removed to make it a cargo versus a passenger transport. But when you scale it up, swapping turrets on a tank chassis to make it an indirect artillery platform in the spur of a moment, there's little chance a universal system will outperform a counterpart which has been expressly designed for the prescribed combat role. Like the rest of the West, Russia has veered away from making the Armata Universal Combat Platform the darling of its motorized ground forces, mostly because it can't anymore. When it was first announced, the T-14 sent the Western world into a frenzy. Could the existing Western main battle tanks hold their weight against the latest Russian offering? On paper, at least, it was close. They had similar armament, top speeds, and armor. With its isolated crew compartment and automated turret, the T-14 may have been able to better protect its operators. It had marginally better range, muzzle energy, fuel efficiency, and maintenance potential than even the American M1 Abrams. But the robust 40-year-old Abrams and Leopard designs with their modern suite of upgrade packages would almost certainly hold their own in a firefight. Which did not bode well for Russia, since by the time they announced the T-14, there were already 10,000 operable Abrams and more than 3,600 Leopard 2s produced and in use around the world. As it turned out, there wasn't much to worry about. The first batch of 12 Armata tanks was delivered in 2015. Despite plans to ultimately acquire 2,300 T-14 tanks by 2025, there are still virtually no Armatas in use throughout the Russian armed forces. As the Armata program was beset by production issues, financial problems, and trial delays, its initial acquisition was scaled back to just 100 experimental vehicles, a number that Russia has fallen well short of reaching. So what's the German Leopard 2's backstory? For one, it had a far more optimal service history since its inception in 1979. It was something of a surprise when the German military started designing the Leopard 2 just a few years after it had come out with the Leopard 1 which had only been in service for about a decade, a very short shelf life for a main battle tank. From the start, the Leopard 1 had been a staple of European defense, with more than 4,700 tanks and 1,741 utility and anti-aircraft variants produced. You can still find upgraded Leopard 1s out there in the wild if you travel to Greece, Turkey, Brazil, or Chile, but by and large, most Leopard-adopting militaries have adopted its more modern counterpart, the third-generation Leopard 2, from Poland to Singapore. Updating the Leopard 1 was a decision made in direct response to improvements in Soviet armor during the later stages of the Cold War. West Germany knew it occupied a strategically vital position on NATO's front lines with the Soviet Union. If the Soviets decided to attack, West Germany needed a competitive main battle tank to resist the threat. 
Fortunately, they succeeded in developing a tank that far outmatched its Soviet opponents. Ironically, the Leopard 2 began its life as a joint development program with the United States to develop a next-generation MBT. The MBT-70 program that eventually spawned the Leopard couldn't quite meet the requirements of either nation, so the US went off to work on the M1 Abrams, while Germany returned to its Leopard 1 and began asking how they could take it to the next level. Under the management of Porsche engineers, the Germans concluded that the new platform could incorporate improved engine transmission upgrades, a coaxial auto cannon, heavier rounds, extendable surveillance cameras, and an independent commander's periscope to improve the crew's situational awareness. While they were there, they decided to beef up the tank's main gun from 105 to the 120mm smoothbore the Leopard retains to this day. The West Germans wanted to see how they were doing so far, so in 1976, they sent a prototype to the US for inspection by American engineers. The Leopard was as agile, if not more, than the American prototype Abrams XM1 in development. They found the Leopard 2 and the XM1 were comparable in firepower and mobility, and that even though the Abrams could resist explosive kinetic energy penetration rounds slightly better, Leopard 2 crews were almost twice as well protected. The Leopard's engine was more reliable. It guzzled less gas and it didn't have as large of a heat signature, even if it was noisier. The Leopard 2 hit the production line shortly after its American audition, having improved on its armor deficiencies. Like any MBT, it has undergone a series of regular systems upgrades that have improved its armor, survivability, firepower, and optics as technology has improved. There were a couple of baseline improvements over previous generations of MBTs that really set the Leopard 2 apart. It had blowout panels on the separator between the turret bustle, with its ready ammunition racks and the crew compartment. It had new thermal night sight systems, digital ballistic computers, improved fire extinguishing systems, improved frontal arc armor arrays, and side skirts that could add new ceramic and composite armor modular plating as required. The latest version of the Leopard is the 2A7, first released in 2014. A consistent string of upgrades have either been implemented or are scheduled to continue improving the platform ever since, which will be discussed in more detail later. Rheinmetall, the manufacturer of the Leopard and Abrams 120mm smoothbore guns, announced in 2015 that it would begin developing a new 130mm variant that would offer a 50% increase in performance in penetration. While Germany has announced the end of the Leopard's service life will likely come around 2030, and Germany and France are already jointly designing its replacement, the main ground combat system, there are more improvements to the Leopard 2A7 in the offing, including upgrades to the current L55 Cannon 120mm ammunition, as well as a new digital turret core system, situational awareness system, and an active protective system. The T-14 tank is capable in its own right. Coming in at a spry 55 tons, it is 12 tons lighter than the 67-ton Leopard 2. Powered by a turbocharged 1500-horsepower 12-speed automatic diesel engine, the T-14 is actually significantly faster on the road than the Leopard, capable of traveling 56 miles an hour to the Leopard's 43. Costing four to five million dollars per unit, the Russian offering is also much cheaper to produce, almost half the cost of the Leopard. It is slightly more maneuverable, has adjustable suspension, and claims to have an operational range of 310 miles, 30 more than the Leopard's 280. If anything, the T-14 may well prove to be a trendsetter. It was, after all, the world's first production tank with an unmanned turret, a design feature the latest generation prototype American Abrams X will replicate. It possesses a larger 125mm smoothbore cannon, an autoloader, reactive armor, and the Afghanit Active Protective System APS, that helps it mitigate the impact of ATGMs that have absolutely eviscerated thousands of T-90s, T-80s, and T-72s that used to form the backbone of the Russian army. The Armata's three-man crew store their rounds in a sealed turret compartment separate from the cockpit. Likewise, the power plant, autoloader, and cockpits are sealed against nuclear, biological, and fire threats, something the Leopard's crew can also boast. Something unique about the T-14 is that it has a merged engine transmission unit that can be swapped in 30 minutes in the field and, in future variants, may be equipped with a massive 152mm gun, which can fire guided missiles capable of shattering armor twice as thick as the Leopard's. But speaking of unique features, the Leopard has a few tricks up its own turret. 
Modern combined operations are undertaken across a variety of terrains and geographic features, waterways and rivers among them. The interior of the Leopard 2 can be sealed, waterproofed, and equipped with a snorkel enabling the vehicle to traverse bodies of water taller than the tank itself. If it needs to, the crew can have up to 12 hours of life support in this sealed configuration, giving its occupants ample protection against the worst chemical and nuclear threats it might encounter on the battlefield. If the temperature rises above 180 degrees, automatic firefighting systems will engage to put the fire out. In terms of armor protection, defense estimates figure that the Leopard 2 had the equivalent protection of 1,840 to 2,920 mm of armor against kinetic energy projectiles, and 2,700 to 4,370 mm of armor protection against chemical explosive rounds. The Leopard 2A6 went even farther, improving the crew survivability with protection equivalents of 5,890 mm to 7,800 mm of armor versus kinetic penetrators, and 9,000 to 11,500 mm of armor versus chemical explosive rounds. Leopard crews can feel safe driving over a variety of IEDs and mines with robust belly armor. Spore liners inside the hull prevent the deadly fracturing of internal armor plates when an explosive projectile hits the external armor but does not penetrate it, something that can actually incapacitate or kill a crew without leaving much of a visible trace on the exterior of the vehicle. The Leopard 2 can fire several different types of rounds. The German DM-33 discarding Sabot anti-tank round would be one of the most common in a head-to-head -head matchup, capable of penetrating 960 mm of steel armor at a range of 2,000 meters. The Leopard 2A7's new L55 cannon barrel is longer than its predecessor, giving ammunition improved penetrating power. The German tank can fire Leihat anti-tank guided missiles up to 3.6 miles away through the main gun, something the Armata allegedly claims it can do up to a distance of 5 miles, which could be the deciding factor in a one-on-one -on -one tank duel. In terms of capacity, the Leopard houses 42 rounds inside the crude turret, 15 additional rounds on the left side of the turret bustle, and 27 stored rounds in a specially protected hull magazine. The Armata, for its part, can hold 45 rounds. Both tanks have an array of 12.7 and 7.62 mm machine guns in addition to their main guns for suppressive fire against infantry and smaller mechanized targets. Next generation sensors and optics are the norm in both models, but this is where the proven Leopard shines. It has a stabilized optical periscope for day and night operations, one that integrates fiber optic gyros, laser rangefinders, image fusion functioning, daylight cameras, and a thermal imaging device. The Leopard's gunner station incorporates a stabilized main sight and an auxiliary targeting telescope, while the driver can maneuver the tank into position using the tank's built-in night vision and thermal drive systems. If the Armata actually existed, we would find a capable foe. It possesses multispectral sights with laser rangefinders, thermals, and wide-angle cameras offering its crew 360-degree situational awareness. Its automated fire control system uses an advanced battlefield management system to analyze targeting data using the tank's built-in muzzle reference system and range sensors. This would certainly give the crew a leg up, as long as all the systems could be kept in good working order. The T-14's turret uses electrical armament stabilization and can fire programmable ammunition, like the gun-launched anti-tank guided missiles previously noted, expressly designed to destroy tanks and even helicopters. It's also worth noting that the T-14 is networked for guidance with other T-14s. They can be aided by a drone cable attachment that can be used indefinitely to distinguish targets using day or night vision, infrared, and add distance and target guidance data. This means if one tank's drone sees a target, the others will too. The Armata, as you can tell, is a tank purpose-built for the digital age. Good luck killing its crew, too. Its forward-based three-man crew are tightly cocooned in a futuristic steel capsule developed by Russian scientists to be 15% lighter than normal steel, yet withstand insanely heavier blast and heat ratings. Russian engineers wrapped this reinforced steel crew compartment in layers of classified composite ceramic plating. Russian engineers took things a step further. The forward position of the tank boasts a revolutionary Malekit dual explosive reactive armor system that can offset the impact of an RPG or anti-tank round in the front, sides, and top of the tank. In the rear, bar armor adds a few additional inches of potentially life-saving buffer space between the point of impact and the rear armor itself, 
Like most modern MBTs, the T-14 utilizes an APS system, with five rocket launchers on either side of the tank that comes in two versions, hard and soft kill versions. Hard kill systems intercept and disable incoming munitions with projectiles of their own, while soft kill systems interfere with the electronic guidance or stabilization mechanisms of incoming rounds using things like laser dazzlers. The Russian-designed Afghanit system is the first in the world to incorporate both in a single system, using millimeter wave radar to target a variety of enemy rounds, including kinetic energy penetrators and tandem charge weapons, like the US-manufactured Javelin. It's not been proven to work 100% of the time, but it's pretty good, analysts believe, at deflecting and destroying artillery shells and unguided rockets that are common on the modern battlefield, and interfering with ATGM guidance systems. Some Russians even say it can protect T-14 crews against the depleted uranium kinetic penetrators in common use among American tank crews, but we'll believe that when we see it. Along those lines, there are almost more unknowns than knowns surrounding the T-14 project, like whether it has actually participated in war games or live fire events, whether the 55-ton tank could actually achieve the same level of survivability as the sturdier Leopard, or whether its autoloader system is as reliable as claimed. What we do know is that there is a reason American tank crews rely on good old quality German engineering and precision by adapting the exact same turret and barrel configuration as the Leopard 2. The Leopard 2 systems can keep its gun leveled no matter what terrain it is traversing, even if it's on a hilly terrain or crossing a busy road. After firing, the barrel snaps back to its initial position in the blink of an eye. Hold my beer, T-14, literally. There's a famous promotional video showing a Leopard 2 holding a stein of German beer on the tip of its turret while it casually launches itself over an obstacle course, and as you might expect, not a drop spills out. As far as we know, the T-14 has more vertical and horizontal recoil, something you don't see on the Leopard, and is slightly less stable than the German model which could delay the target acquisition for its next firing. Ultimately, the Leopard has slightly heavier armor, but the Armata is faster, can travel farther, and is much cheaper to produce. Though apparently not cheap enough for the Russian MOD, it also has an autoloader with a heavier primary gun effective up to 5 kilometers. Using its 3U BK-21 Sprinter ATGMs, that range increases up to 12 kilometers. Both tanks have not, as yet, faced advanced tanks of their same generation in combat. Yes, the T-14 takes a lot of flak. We laugh because the tank broke down in its first public outing at the 2015 Moscow Victory Day Parade. I'm sure Putin would bite your arm off for a mechanically challenged T-14 to parade around these days. He could only drum up a single T-34 for this year's iteration, even though the decision to do so was likely motivated by legitimate security concerns. Still, in a hypothetical one-on-one -on -one battle that blatantly ignores today's geopolitical realities, the fact of the matter is that the Russian tank incorporates and surpasses many of the design features that make the Leopard 2 as great as it is. The armored crew capsule and automated turret offer greater protection and lethality. Its next-generation APS system, high-fidelity sensors, and computer targeting would lend it marked but not decisive advantage. But the fact that the existing Leopard is a time-tested main battle tank of over 40 years with a formidable base platform that will be continually improved upon and upgraded through 2030 is a huge mark in its favor. Only the German government and certain foreign buyers know what kind of next-generation equipment has found its way into the Leopard 2A7+, so it's impossible to know how it would fare in a fight. Already capable of matching up against the T-14 Armata, the fact remains that the price of upgrading existing and already manufactured Leopards with next-generation technology is far cheaper than producing a new T-14, something Russia can't even dream of as the economic and military consequences of its ill-planned invasion of Ukraine mount. In the end, the accuracy of rangefinders, sensors, and targeting computers would most likely determine the outcome of this tank duel. As one commentator noted, Small differences in lethality will likely matter less if one tank is able to see the other, while the other cannot detect at similar ranges. The tank that can find, target, and hit the other from the longer range is likely to prevail in any kind of war engagement. It would be rare to actually find ourselves in a scenario where both tanks are hunting the other. With the ubiquity of drones and aerial surveillance, tank battles a la Kursk have become relics of a bygone era. Even if the T-14 boasts greater reach, with its laser-guided rounds and rate of fire with its automatic loading mechanism, it wouldn't matter as much as we might like to think. 
Isolated and unsupported as most Russian tanks have been in Ukraine, the T-14 would be an easy and favorable target to Ukrainian infantry, who would just as soon engage it with a far cheaper Javelin or AT-4 than a Leopard of their own. The true difference maker, however, in a fight between the Leopard 2 and the T-14 Armata would likely not be in the tank's technology, armament, or munitions, but in the quality of its crews, and you can take that to the bank. This is where the Leopard, or any modern Western tank for that matter, would truly shine. Operated by competent, well-trained crews with effective NCOs, something the Russians no longer have, tanks are only as good as the humans inside them. With a strong emphasis on combined and joint operations, traditional Leopard tank crews would almost certainly benefit from NATO air superiority, better intelligence, and integration with remote assets and battlefield management internal systems, not to mention far greater interoperability with other NATO standard vehicles. Ukraine may lack much air superiority, but it will still be receiving training on how to properly employ them from some of the best instructors in the world. Technology and resilient systems matter on the modern battlefield and will continue to matter in the future, but where these factors fail, discipline, cohesion, and training will take care of the rest. Until the Armata actually enters the production line, something that for Russia may never even happen, as recent reports indicate that in the light of recent military setbacks, it has halted its 20 trillion ruble program altogether. One-on-one -on -one showdowns between it and the Leopard 2 will likely remain confined to our imagination. But if you had to pick one, who would you go with? Let us know in the comments.